Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio. For the Masses. I am. How you doing? How you doing? Tonight, Tuesday, December 29th, 2020. Three hundred and sixty-four days into the new year. Only two days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the Planets. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? Ah. All right. It's cold and crispy here in Burbank. Yeah, I think uh, today we hit about... Oh, man. I'm going to say it was probably about 60 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, which is pretty crisp. That was at noon. Right now, we've got snow in the mountains here in Burbank. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Got some snow last night. And uh, it's cold. It's cold. It's cold. Out there right now, it's probably... uh, I don't mean to make you upset, but for us, it's cold. You know, everything's relative. I'm going to say it's probably 40. You know, it's crisp. It's crisp. That's a crisp night out there. Okay. Tonight, Grant Cameron. Oh, man. You know, we're so so blessed here. We... uh, uh, have conversations with the best and the brightest uh, all around the world on every subject. And and every show with Grant Cameron is like the greatest, greatest thing ever. So Grant is here tonight. We're going to be talking about, I'm going to pick his brain on uh, the biggest stories of uh, our community for 2020. And, and, and we'll see if I can catch Grant going, you know, I don't know much about that case. We'll see. We'll see if I can make that happen. All right. And so we'll do that. Now, I'm, we're going to be talking about what's going on over at TTSA. I've chosen the word downfall. That's right. The downfall of TTSA and uh, the funding of the UAP task force. We're going to talk about that, too, as well. But the downfall of TTSA. And why would I? why would I use that word? Well, look, when... When your three top dudes, right, that help form the company with you, I'm talking about, of course, Chris Mellon, Louis Elizondo, and and Steve Justice, um, your top three guys, the stars of your TV show, all of that, right, just right there, and they help you start the company, and uh, three years later, they choose to split, choose to bail. You're not going to bail on the company that you started if things are great. (laughs) 
Things are great. Things are taking off. Things are happening. They, they, you're not going to quit. You're only going to quit because there's no future. That is why I call it the downfall of TTSA. You can spin it any way you like. Okay, that's that's up to you. You, you can absolutely spin this. Sure, I get it. And then there is tomorrow night, our final show of the year with Dr. Stephen Greer. Okay, so whoo. And then it's New Year's Eve. And then it's New Year's. And then it's 2021. Yay. <sighs> Rivermooncoffee.com. That's right. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Follow me right there. You never know what I'm going to tweet. That's right. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox in Twitter. And join in on the show live in real time. It's right in front of me each night on the show. And, of course, hashtag F2BQ is a fade to black questions. Uh, two chat rooms open, one over at Spreaker, one over at KGRA The Planet. And KGRA just launched a new website. So I don't know. <clears throat> I haven't. I hope they have a chat room over there. <laughs> Does anybody know? Does anybody know? Somebody uh, somebody tweet me that KGRA has a chat room. So I now be, they've got a brand new website. And I, I was over checking it out today. It's pretty cool. Okay. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Uh, I want to uh, uh, give a quick shout out to all of the winners of the Fade to Black memberships. Um, we sent out uh, 15 of the 18 uh, that responded. Okay, so uh, that went out over the weekend with a special code for everybody. The majority have already signed up. So welcome, and there you go. Uh, there are two that I don't know what's going on with, with email, right? I, I just can't figure that part out. I think uh, uh, our email is in a spam folder somewhere. So if you're one of those two, check your spam folder. Uh, I keep replying back to your emails, and and you keep sending me back stuff. So I, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me or anybody else here, um, including Drew. And then there are three... No, now it's one. Three that didn't respond. Two that finally got back to me today. So if you're listening to the show, we'll get you your codes tomorrow. And then there is one last one, one straggler. And uh, if they haven't reached out to me by tomorrow, I will say their name on the air. Yep. I just, there's your heads up, man. There's your warning. So uh, that last straggler, kind of hoping he or she doesn't respond. Uh, I would just love to embarrass somebody tomorrow on the air. All right. Now, tonight, Grant Cameron is here. It's going to be a great show. Uh, really looking forward to it. And uh, we had some issues in sound check. Going right, I'm like, uh, dude, uh, e, uh, uh, I got to start the show. And uh, so <laughs> I think everything's going to be fine. He sounds great. Uh, he's having issues hearing me. So it's going to be really funny what's going to go down here in about 20 minutes. But Grant Cameron is here. And, of course, tomorrow night, our last show of the year, Dr. Stephen Greer. Let's get to the breaking news. A Colorado man has the variant of the coronavirus from the United Kingdom that health officials say is more transmissible than other strains of the virus. It is the first known case of the variant that I'm calling COVID-20. It's the first strain in the United States. The man who was in his 20s and is in isolation in Elbert County, Colorado, has no travel history. He didn't just arrive from the United Kingdom, right? And he's got COVID-20. The question I have is, how is it possible to test for it? 
tests are able to detect variants. I mean, either you got COVID-19 or not, right? It's like on or off. But how did they figure out that he had COVID-20? Well, it's called B117. It's COVID-19 B117. That's not as that's not as sexy as COVID-20, which it should be called. But anyway, I'm just asking the obvious question. How did they figure that out? Millions of COVID tests going down a day in the United States, and somehow they find one guy with COVID-20. I don't know. It's funky. All right. This announcement came out yesterday. Small drones will be allowed to fly over people and at night in the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration announced yesterday. A significant step towards commercial deliveries. That's right. All drones will require a new technology for identification from the ground. The rules will take effect 60 days after the publication in the Federal Register later on in January. Drone manufacturers will have 18 months to begin producing drones with remote ID. And operators will have an additional year to provide uh, remote ID. Crazy, right? To fly over crowds of people, commercial drones. What are they going to do? T-shirt cannons? I'm just saying. Federal investigators, now you knew, you knew this was coming. You just knew it. I want to thank Awakening Man. He's so good. Federal investigators are looking into the evidence. The Antioch, Tennessee man who detonated a bomb in downtown Nashville on Christmas morning had spent time hunting for alien life forms in a nearby state park and was interested in lizard people. Anthony Quinn Warner may have been motivated, at least in part, by paranoia over 5G technology, but that they also found writings that contain ramblings about assorted conspiracy theories, including the idea of shape-shifting reptilian creatures that appear in human form and are attempting world domination. Federal agencies are working to figure out if the belief somehow contributed to Warner detonating that bomb inside of an RV parked near 2nd Avenue, North and Commerce Street, around 6.30 a.m. Absolutely crazy. Now, of course, it killed himself. Suicide bombing, injuring three others, and damaging more than 40 buildings. You knew it was coming. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to Jude Law. Jude Law today insists that he is just 48 years old. When did the movie AI come out? When did the movie AI come out? Somebody pop it up for me here on Twitter. And he's just 48. Didn't that movie come out like... 25 years ago, 1995, somewhere, right? right? Am I, it wasn't later than that. So I guess Jude Law was like 23 years old. Could he, be? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe AI came out later. I don't know. Well, maybe not even the release date. When did they film it? Cause they had problems with it. So it was delayed. Uh, when did they start production? When did they have principal photography? With Jude Law, what year? Because I'm just not buying that he is 48 years old. Ted Danson today is 73. I'm buying into that. John Voight today, Ray Donovan. John Voight today is 82. And guitar great, Neil Giraldo today, 65 years old. Of course, the husband and guitar player for Pat Benatar. And uh, I've got mad, mad respect for Neil. Great, great player. Groundbreaking. Great player. Happy birthday, Neil. Our dead guy's birthday today is Cozy Powell. 1947 to 1998, died at the age of 50. Cozy was one of the greatest drummers in music history, period. Playing with the Jeff Beck group, Rainbow. Gary Moore, Robert Plant, Brian May, Whitesnake, Emerson, Lake, and Powell, the Michael Schenker Group, and Black Sabbath. Cozy also appeared on at least 
66 albums. Cozy died on April 5th, 1998, following a car crash while driving a Saab 9000 at 104 miles per hour in bad weather on the M4 motorway near Bristol in the United Kingdom. Happy birthday, Cozy. On this day in history, 1845, it went down. Texas, Tejas, enters the Union as the 28th state. On this day in history, 1845. You know, would that have, especially back then, did that like effectively double the size of the United States? (laughs) Think about it on a map. Probably. All right. Fader fact. Oh, this is a great one. 2001 for AI. Okay, yeah, it was released in 2001. I want to know about principal photography. But even that's 20 years ago. Yeah, even that. All right? Yeah, that's crazy. AI released in 2001. I, I see that. I see that. I want to know about principal photography. I want to nail that down. I... I just, I can't believe that Jude Laws is only. um, And what about the movie Gattaca? When did Gattaca come out? Yeah. Was that before AI? How could Jude Law be 48 years old? Somebody's lying. I saw Jude Law on a Broadway show in summer of 1987. Or 1997. (laughs) 1987, Jude Law was 12. All right. Oh, fader fact. Okay. Now, one of the greatest scenes in all of cinema history, okay? One of the greatest scenes is when Luca Brasi in The Godfather gets killed in the bar. It's one of the great scenes. Remember the the wire around the neck and they're choking him and and his tongue sticks out, boom, falls. Okay, that 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 scene, unquestionably, one of the greatest scenes in all of film, right? Okay. But here's the fader fact about Luca Brazzi. You ready? He was played by Lenny Montana. Okay? Lenny Montana was actually a member of the Colombo crime family. That's right. And he was sent to monitor the set of The Godfather in 1971 by the Colombo crime family. That's right. And he meets everybody. You know, and he was six foot six. And he meets everybody, and they kind of check him out, and he's hanging out. They're filming the movie. And they said, we've, we've got to get you in this film. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. And he gets the gig at the beginning of the movie where you see uh, Luca Brazzi at the wedding, right? And and he's going to go in and, and meet Corleone. And he keeps repeating, uh, you know, you have a blessed son. You have a great, you know, he's repeating those lines. That was him actually in real life trying to memorize the script, and they caught that on film and used it. That's right. And that is your fader fact. Tonight, Grant Cameron is here. Tonight, Grant Cameron is here. We're winding down 2020. Need to uh, absolutely make sure that these last three shows, last night, Marla Martinson... Gattaca came out in 1997. Now we're getting somewhere. How can Jude Law just be 48 years old? I'm I'm I, I'm I'm right about this because Jude Law looks like if you look at him today, I forget that new uh, TV series that he's in, the second day, the third day, whatever it's called. Um, Jude Law looks like he's 75 years old. So. That's it. I'm sticking by that. He's not 48. Okay. Want to make sure that these last three shows, you know, last night with Marla Martinson, uh, tonight, very important show. We're running out of time. We've only got two days left. We've got to bring in the best. We are bringing in Grant Cameron to talk about all of the UFO stories from 2020, where we are today, and what the future is 
for TTSA and the UAP task force. So we're going to be doing all of that tonight. And of course, what is Grant up to today? I think he's taking dancing lessons and uh, we'll be talking about that too as well. And he'll be with us at the bottom of the hour tomorrow night, right here on fade to black, Dr. Stephen Greer. And uh, we'll be talking to Dr. Greer about his new film, of course, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and its impact. It's a huge hit. And what disclosure may look like in 2021. So all of that is set for tomorrow night. And this is the point of the show where I drink my River Moon coffee. Hit my River Moon coffee. Man. Man. God. Man. Best coffee in the world. Best coffee. Sorry, Jimmy. I had to send this again. It's my favorite. Okay, let me see. Let me watch it. Which which one is it? What, what's going on here? Is there music to this? Let me see. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. That's from Donnie Douglas. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thank you for that, Donnie. The best movie that he's in, Road to Perdition. I look. I'm a big uh, Jude Law fan. No, you know what was even better? Oh, man, I've got other stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, the movie where they have the marketing company and uh, Jude Law. Let me see here. Hold on for a second. Let me get to I am B because um, there is a there's a film, the... Oh, man, we've got the DVD. We've watched it uh, so many times. Now, that's going to be, uh, let's go back to mid-2000s. Uh, I Heart Huckabees. Excellent film. Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. That was excellent. Jude, Jude Law, that was made, uh, that was all CG. That was made, like, in an apartment uh, in Santa Monica. Yeah, Gigolo Joe, Artificial Intelligence, 2001. Enemy at the Gates. Jude Law was excellent in that. Uh, let's see. Gattaca, 1997, right there. Um, I think it might have been Gattaca the first time I had seen Jude Law. I watch Gattaca all the time. I think Gattaca is one of those, you know... I think you could say it's got a cult following. Today, it's it's uh, it's a film that I can watch over and over again. It is just so well made, so good, and uh, great cast too as well. But uh, yeah, Enemy at the Gates, Road to Perdition, AI, Artificial Intelligence, right there in a row, and then Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, excellent. He was great in Alfie, I Heart Huckabees. Um, uh, that's right. He played Errol Flynn in the aviator, a series of unfortunate events. Um, and there was another, wasn't, uh, the, Oh, did you hear that? Siri just started mentioning Jude law films. That was trippy. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Oh, man. Sherlock Holmes. That was a, a horribly bad film. Um, Repo Man. Eh. Uh, Contagion. Eh. 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 Yeah. 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 This is not. Uh, it's not looking good. He, You know, he's got like a solid 10 year run of some bad stuff. The Young Pope was good. Yeah, that that was pretty good. Um, da, ba, 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 ba. And then uh, I'm trying to think of this this new series, the new Pope. Uh, that was really really good. The third day, 
the third day. I got three episodes into that, and uh, nah. So we got Sherlock Holmes 3 coming out. Peter Pan and Wendy, he's playing Captain Hook. Uh, no date on that yet. Oh, that's pre-production. And then Megalopolis, and uh, we'll see what that is. Okay, now, uh, that everything that I was going to see, that, that's how much I like Jude Law. When was the last time you guys saw me just lose my mind and, and just go off script? Well, I just did, over Jude Law. I like Jude Law. I heart Huckabees. AI. Okay. And Gattaca. Right there. If you only make three films your entire career. Yeah, I did uh, Gattaca. I did AI. I did I heart Huckabees. And then retired. You're good. You're good. You're good. All right. One of the things that um, uh, I'll, I'll spend... Uh, some more time on this tomorrow. One of the things that I wanted to talk about right now that I didn't because I was talking about Jude Law is why is it that I chose, why is it that people out there, especially in the media, have ignored some of the things that I have gifted them over the years? Gifted them. Right, I've I've broken some really cool stories. I've been right in front of things and and uh, and seen things and broke it out. In the very 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 beginning of the show, we had the Malibu underwater base. I wrote up an article, posted it on the website back when we were small, and that thing went viral, went nuts. Had ABC News. Uh, come over and and interview me. Uh, 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 tons, uh, just it was crazy, and we all know what happened with that, right? Just absolutely blew up. Um, the that was almost that was eight years ago, right? What what's going on with that? I don't get it. But yet these other stories out there that uh, in the UFO community that the the media tends to pick up, it's not necessarily because it is the best story to cover. It's probably one that was paid for, or it's one that's influenced by uh, uh, a public relations firm. But it's not necessarily the biggest story to cover. I don't get that. And I had compiled a list earlier today. I'll go through it tomorrow night on some of the stories that, that we knew about in the UFO community over the last seven, eight years, but the media never covered. And I'll do that tomorrow night. I promise I will get to all of that tomorrow night. Jude Law took over the show tonight. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, right here, live from Canada, Grant Cameron. Tomorrow night, Fade to Black, last show of 2020. That's right. The year so sucky, they named it twice. Tomorrow night, last show of the year, Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this short break with Grant Cameron. Stay with us. Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. 
with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection or a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. Go Beckley Tappy. This is the only way forward. This is Paid to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, folks. It's troubling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. Permanent industrial glue impossible to remove? Not anymore, because Handyman Formula by D-Bond is a patented chemical adhesive remover. It's used in the building and home maintenance industry, but now it's available for your home use, for your DIY projects. Unglue stickers, silicone rubber, labels, price tags, flex tape, weather stripping, carpet glue, wood glue, liquid nails, even 3M5200, and it dissolves graffiti. Yeah, graffiti. Handyman Formula by D-Bond works, and it's safe to use on most surfaces. No need to call a professional. Don't get out the pliers and blowtorch. Just apply a little Handyman Formula by D-Bond, and wait 90 seconds, then quickly and easily pull the items apart. Get unstuck. Visit dbondhandymanformula.com. That's dbondhandymanformula.com, or call 561-575-4200. Handyman Formula by D-Bond. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey. You're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our second to last show. For 2020, Grant Cameron joins us live from Canada. We're going to be covering all of the latest UFO, ET, UAP headlines and stories from 2020. We're going to be talking about that. And of course, what I'm calling the downfall of TTSA. We'll see what Grant has to say about that. And also the funding of the UAP task force. Oh, big news. And what is going to go on with all of this with our community moving forward into 2021? Grant has been a UFO researcher since 1975 and was recognized as both the Leeds Conference International Researcher of the Year and the UFO Congress Researcher of the Year. He's a world-renowned expert on UFOs, conspiracies, government cover-ups, and has spent decades watching and chronicling developments around the extraterrestrial contact. Now, he is the author of Charlie Red Star. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, our favorite, Grant Cameron. Grant, good evening, man. How are you? Just doing fine, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, great to uh, hear your voice again. 
before we get started, Kent, how how excited are you for New Year's Eve? <laughs> In terms of UFOs you're talking? No, in terms of getting 2020 behind us. Um, I don't know. It's um, not as bad here as it is there in terms of what's happened in 2020. But uh, I, I don't really look at it. I look at it from day to day. So I, I really don't see. Uh, I think 2021 tw- 20, uh, will have uh, new challenges as well. And um, But I can see where people want to sort of uh, move on and uh get all this uh, this stuff that's happened during the year behind us. Well, the number one search in Google in the United States is how do I move to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got, it's strange. We've got um, 13 territories and provinces, and we have um, seven of them that are getting hammered, and we got six that basically don't have any COVID at all. So um, it depends where you live. And um, the border's closed. We don't go to the States, and they're trying to keep people out, and so we'll, we'll see what where it comes. But I know it's uh, a lot of people looking at um, different places to go and different opportunities. So we'll see what happens. When when you say that's interesting, I was talking to Jason Quit about this. When you say the border is closed, is that for cars or is this like airplanes and everything? Everything, unless you have a uh, reason, like unless you're doing business, uh, you can't go for pleasure or that kind of stuff you can't um they'll basically stop you so um like desta my assistant went across and she had um you know job that she was going to do there and stuff like so she managed to get across but most people don't want to go they just uh everybody's sitting tight and uh you know they see what's going on in various parts of uh you know the world and nobody wants to move now you're in manitoba right now, um, and you, you must have border crossings there uh, yeah. into the United States. And so there, uh, what is, what's up? Like, uh, are the roads just blocked? Right? And no, then- like, I mean, the, tr- the trucks are going across. So business type stuff, they'll do it. Or if you take a look at um, the situation in Detroit and Windsor. Right. So Windsor is on one side of the border, Detroit's on the other side. And you have a lot of people moving back and forth across the border there because you've got a lot of nurses working in Detroit. Right. But basically, they'll try to stop you if you want to go for a holiday to, uh, you know, L.A. for the weather or whatever. Um, it's basically just business. So unless you've got a business thing, they'll sort of block you from going across. Yeah. So you pull up, you got the kids in the back seat. You're not moving <laughs> forward, right? Yeah. 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 So I, I, I don't think anybody's tried. I know Desta got across. She... Um, she was determined she was going to get across. She actually went to L.A. and she's um, still there. But, um, yeah, no, nobody's I don't have really heard too many people want to go anywhere. They're just sort of I mean, they're moving around in Canada. You can move from west from here west. You can move anywhere you want. If you're coming in from the east, you have to quarantine. So it depends. Again, in Canada, there are some areas that didn't have their first covid case till a couple of weeks ago. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about um, before we get to the subject of UFOs uh, was Trudeau. Uh, it was about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, where he talked about the big reset. Did you did you see that uh, that television uh, that the live stream that he did? Uh, no, it doesn't ring a bell. No. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we'll just move on. It alarmed a lot of people in in the community. They're like, Trudeau is about the new world order, right? And well, yeah. There's there's so much. That's one of the things I found in ufology today. Because we're going to get into ufology, but in the in the world today, I mean, you really can't believe almost anything that's put out. I mean, uh, we, I got I got a um, an email from the states and said. Um, uh, just they, they wanted me to tell me that that China was in Canada on the American border and was preparing to invade. Yes, I, I, said, saw, I, saw, I got and, the and same so email. I said, like I live on the border. I think if there was like you know um, a couple million troops and Chinese tanks, we would see them. And that, like, no, it's not true. And then you mentioned Trudeau. So then a couple of weeks ago, I got another email, and it was like um, just to let me know that Trudeau had sold all the gold in Canada to China. And I'm going, well, no, I don't think so. I mean, the president, or the same as the United States, has no gold. Canada has no gold. Uh, it's all held by private companies. So, no, he didn't sell all the gold to China. And that's the thing is, like, it's a situation now is really bad in ufology 
is that people sort of believe almost anything that comes out or the one you saw today with the vaccine from the well, it was like last couple of days has been a big story in Brazil. And you're going to get a lot of people buying this in Brazil, where the, 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 the head of Brazil says you can't take the vaccine because you're going to turn into a crocodile. And and women will grow beards, and and I believe, and a lot of people will just buy into that, and that's the whole thing that the, the UFO community used to be sort of like you could tell what was garbage and what wasn't. Now it's like just so much stuff floating around, and you get a lot of people who believe a lot of the stories that are out there. So how do you distinguish, you know, the disinformation from the information? And because that's the way the government actually operated. If you go back to the Robertson panel, that was the whole deal. They were going to bring in Walt Disney. And so what I've always said that they do to disrupt disrupt the UFO community is they don't need to kill anybody or do anything like that. All they do is throw, if you've got a story, like if you break a story, they put a second story in that counters your story that has different sources and uh, just throw mud in the water. And that that's the problem that we're facing is there's so many bad stories, so many bad um, uh, leads and stuff like that, that you really can't figure out where to go and how to, how to sort the, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, the the email that you're talking about because I got the same one about uh, you know China entering Canada getting ready to you know they've amassed their troops uh, on the Canadian United States border they're getting ready to invade the United States and and so I got that same email I think we're in the same group right and and, and yeah, it could be. Yeah, I, I would imagine that's floated all over the place right right I'm not going to say any more than that because I don't want anybody yeah. to know what uh, what goes on with our little uh, group here but nonetheless um I'm wondering the source of the original email who typed that up who dreamed that up before the distribution right I want to know who that individual is to come up with something so crazy because in that group somebody replied back dude I live right here there's no Chinese troops, right? <laughs> There's nothing going on. Is it, is it like a political person who's putting it out? Because you had the thing with this um, this explosion. I didn't even watch it in, in was it Nashville or something? And yes. and they put that one as a Chinese missile. And and you, this stuff is coming up so fast. And it, it maybe is it clicks that people want to you know get huge clicks on crazy stories. It's it's like you know in the UFO community we had that thing about the. Uh, you know, the off world planets and, and the, the star guys and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, uh, those were the guys that when you went to places like, um, uh, conscious life expo, I would give a lecture on like consciousness or something like that. I'd get 35 people and you go across the hall to one of these, you know, uh, really wild story things. And it was like 600 people. And there was hundred people standing in line at furious as could be, cause they had, they'd oversold the tickets and they couldn't get in the room. And that's the kind of stuff is that stuff is really, really popular. The wilder the story. And, and we even run into that problem in you, the UFO community is that, um, I, I, I think that a lot of the UFO community is just into entertainment, that they're really not serious researchers. They just want to hear a good story. Give, tell me a good uh, uh, you know, UFO sighting or a good story, whatever. And so these stories can take off because that's the kind of stuff people are looking for is something really new and explosive. And it's like it's like entertainment. Whereas in the old days, um, you had to you know have your source and you had to, um, almost like the Stanton Friedman stuff, you had to... Uh, be really credible and put your story out. And there was not that many. Now it's like every day it's 24 seven. And the stories that are floating around are just like absolutely insane. And and the weird part is you see people are, are buying into this stuff. Yeah. The, uh, the Nashville bomber. Now I just uh, broke this story. This came in uh, from one of the fader knots uh, right before the show tonight. And I actually went vetted the story and saw the news report on it uh, from ABC, right? And it's uh, federal investigators are looking into, the bomber's name was Anthony Quinn Warner in Nashville uh, from Christmas morning with the RV. And they're going to look, uh, they are reporting now that he had spent time hunting for alien life forms in a nearby state park and was interested in lizard people. It said that they found writings in his home that contain ramblings about assorted conspiracy theories, including the idea of shape-shifting reptilian creatures that appear in human form and attempt world domination. 
You know, and it, it, it goes right back to what you just said. You know, some people uh, go and wh- whoever they're listening to, whatever, you know, and, and these groups are, are pretty large uh, that are out there and they get sucked into this. You know, yeah. now I'm not saying that there isn't something to the story. You know, we've got a reptilian DNA yeah. in our brain. Okay. All right. I, I, I can go with that. Taking things to the next step where you're going to uh, drive around an RV and start blowing up things because of this, that's where we've just got to pump the brakes here and, and back up and, and be very careful and use discernment with this. And not everybody has that strength or power uh, to avoid the rabbit hole, do they? Yeah. And, and, uh, and the, the other problem is that everybody can post immediately. Like it's the, you, you can, you're, everybody's uh, like a New York times and it's, you can get whatever numbers you want based upon the stories you put out that, that a lot of the stuff isn't really getting vetted because there's just so many people posting stories on all sorts of things. And there's even been shows. There was a show in Canada. It was called uh, this hour is 22 minutes. And they actually did a segment where they were, would go to people and they would see how far they could actually get people to believe. And they had like the one story where the Canadian parliament buildings was made of ice and we're uh, getting a petition here so they can put a, a dome over to the parliament building because of global warming. And we're trying to save the, the thing from melting and people were, and they were, they were, I think they were at Stanford university or something. And, and people are going, yeah, yeah, I'll sign the petition. And it was like, and they were pushing it as far as they could to show how how people re- really just don't don't vet anything, and uh, so it's almost like we're in the 21st century. But the sort of the people are going back to almost like the 15th or 16th century, where very simple things that you would uh, 20 years ago would have said that's absolutely insane. Now a lot of people think it's not that insane. A, a Chinese missile fired into Nashville, Tennessee. Right. Ah, uh, you know, and and look, I love a good conspiracy. I do. They are fun. Some of them pan out. They do. I agree. Chinese missiles into Nashville. Ah. You know, uh but somebody out there is cranking this stuff out. And one of the problems that we have today, Grant, you've been in this community for a long time, is our our community can handle conspiracies. Our yeah. our community can. We are used to it. We know how to vet. We know how you know. And uh, like you said earlier, you've got to bring your A game into the UFO community. You've got to bring stuff backed up with facts and and so forth. Our community can deal with it. The rest of the world they don't have the expertise or the experience with conspiracy theories like we do. And right now, the planet, because of COVID, because of the other things that have gone down with racism and uh, the elections and everything else, that conspiracy theory now is what everybody is jumping to first. And they're not spending any time to debunk or investigate or use any rationale. They're just jumping into it, aren't they? they? The world can't handle conspiracy theory. Yeah. And there's just so much of it that, that how do you vet it? Because you, you know the same as I do that there are really only maybe a few thousand actual researchers who actually are doing any work. Everybody else is just sort of listening to what's going on. They're not doing any research at all. And because they're busy with their kids and, and trying to make a living and stuff like that. And so they have no ability to spend the time to vet it. And uh, it's, it's kind of a difficult situation where um, it's almost like, you know, I, I remember we, um, uh, Desta and I were in, um, um, uh, Tucson, Arizona, we were looking at James McDonald's files. And I remember we found this letter by Jacques Vallée and Jacques Vallée has done this for many years. And, and it was this 1967 letter from Jacques Vallée. And he said, that's it. I've had it. I'm out of this. These people are insane. I'm quitting. I'm never coming back in UFOs. And he's done this like every couple of years since 1967. And that's what he's playing off is this idea where you just run up against this crazy stuff and you're spending all your time trying to put the crazy stuff down and uh, it, it you're just swamped by stories because everybody can post and they can post like 20 stupid stories a day and everybody's got the power of the New York Times. Now, uh, looking at uh, 2020, uh, what UFO stories uh, stick out for you? Well, um, the, the the big stories, I guess, the, you, the big one, it would be the TTSA, this big move that's just taken place. And um, I see it maybe a little bit different than other people do. 
The Israeli story is, is another one where, where there's sort of a debate going on. Is this disinformation uh, or is this, uh, this Israeli guy actually talking about something that's real? And uh, the question I have, if you're going to say that this is disinformation from the government, is the idea that who are we disinforming? Because it's the old deal is there, there's only that many, a few researchers, there's really not that many uh, researchers to disinform. And, and, and you get a lot of that in the UFO community that they, people think that that we're, we're the target, the government is watching us. And in a lot of cases, I don't think the government really, really cares. So the Israeli story, I think, was pretty interesting because what I, what I picked up from that was it's not as crazy as you would think it is. At first, I thought it was like one of these, you know, crazy conspiracy things or the guy was putting it out or whatever. But when I started to look, I realized like, man, there is actual stories that back this up and like credible stories. So I'll give you a couple a couple examples. 1975, Bob, Bob Emenegger, who you may have interviewed at some point, does UFO uh, past, present and future. He's brought into Norton Air Force Base by uh, the Defense Department to do this UFO documentary. And they give him the Holloman Air Force Base film. And this is the film where supposedly the UFOs land at Holloman Air Force Base. And when it's all said and done, I'm interviewing Bob. I dealt a lot of time with him. And I said to Bob, I said, you know, Bob, you know, there's eight seconds of film in that thing. You told me you, you took it back to the Pentagon. And uh, he said, well, yeah. And I said, well, you told me that they took it back. Well, no, that was that was just background. I said, what do you mean it was background? Well, it didn't show anything. So you have actually eight seconds of actual footage from the Holloman Air Force Base film. The NIDS people contacted me. Uh, there was a big hunt. Uh, Christopher Dodd, the senator, went after this film. I know Hal Putoff and, and these guys were looking, trying to backtrack this film. It appears that that film actually did, that film actually existed, that there was a landing. So that would indicate that there was this contact between high-level officials and beings. So it's not as crazy as you think it is when you start looking at the stories. The other one was in the 1980s, and I don't know if you were around ch chasing all this stuff, but there was the big story then was the whole thing about the, the live alien story. And Linda Howe tells the story of being offered to go and 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 uh, interview the keeper of the the EBE one, the first uh, live alien, and she tells this whole story about you know going to self to um, pay phones and it's like a spy novel type thing. And the night before, she bought the ticket to go to Houston and they they canceled it. And Bob Emenegger, talk, I talked to him about it, and he said, "Ah, it's all garbage. It's MJ12 stuff. My stuff was real. They gave me all the real stuff, and I got to talk to people. UFOs are real. All the rest of this MJ12, it's all Richard Doty, and all this is garbage and stuff like that." And I said, "Well, Bob, uh, weren't you offered an interview with the live alien? And because Bill Moore was offered, Whitley Strieber was offered, Linda Howe was offered, and all these people were, made this offer." And he said, "Well, yeah." And I said, "Well, who offered you the interview with the live alien?" And he said. Paul Chartle. And I said, was Paul Chartle reliable? He was the security manager at Norton Air Force Base. He said, yeah. And I said, well, there you go, Bob. And so the, the, this story of the live alien was out there that we had this ambassador thing in the 1980s. And um, then you have the um, the story that, that you'll see breaking. I don't know if you've followed this story. There's a tape that has leaked out from Kit Green. Do you know about this tape of the um, talking to the intuitive? Yes, I've heard of the tape. Okay, so on the tape, he's talking to her and he's saying, who are we dealing with? And she starts talking about this portal off the coast of California, off Catalina Island. And that's where the, the Nimitz thing happened, mm -hmm. off Catalina Island. And there's high level officials meeting with these beings and that they are, um, there's a geological, what do they call it? A geological situation. And it basically refers, I think, to the faults off the coast of California. And they're letting these officials know. Now, Kit Green is not, you know, a uh, crazy man. Uh, and he's sitting there listening to the story on this tape. And he's going, OK, OK, hang on. And he's writing this stuff down. And you get that and you start to think like, wow, maybe there's something to this. Maybe there there is something because this woman, he's he's referring to her as being better than than Yuri Geller, 95 percent accurate in all the, the medical material that she had provided him and stuff like that. And it seemed like um, like he and Gary Nolan were, were dealing with this woman. So you get these kind of stories that indicate, yeah, or th there's a story from the Canadian government. Uh, I, I worked on that when I first started. Wilbert Brockhouse Smith was the guy who ran the program. There's a letter that I put on the internet a little while ago that showed uh, Wilbert Brockhouse Smith, 1959, he writes a letter to a guy in Canada and he says, just for your information, every nation of the world has been informed of the existence of the visitors or something to that effect. And what each country does is up to them, which again indicates that there was some sort of contact 
between the intelligence and high level officials. So the Israeli story seems really crazy. And then you start looking at it. And that's probably what I think. And I, I've written books about this, where I think what you do if you're going to put out a story is you do the you take information surrounded by disinformation and put it out because then nobody can tell what's real, what's not real. The story gets out almost like the Bob Lazar thing. He, he's there. He actually goes on the base. He's, he's doing all this kind of stuff. But they know the whole story is going to fall apart as soon as he goes public. And when he goes public, the story falls apart. And nobody knows whether to believe what's going on is real. And everybody comes out with the idea, oh, Area 51, there's UFO stuff going on at Area 51, but you can't confirm anything. And none of the stories... Yeah, over the 45 years I've worked on, you've, we've never confirmed a single story. We've got these rumors about this probably happened, but we don't know. Because uh, that's what they're doing is they're using this information, disinformation thing to keep people off guard so nobody can get the story. Because if they want to release the story, the president stands up and tells you what's going on. And that's not what they're doing. They're doing this leak thing uh, and, and nobody can cons substantiate the leak, whether it's this triangle photo that just came out or what it is. It's this same pattern all the time. You leak it but you can't confirm it. The Israeli uh, uh, defense official, um, it turn, it, this reflects back to what you just said, right? Where you don't know what to believe because something will come out and that will kill the original story. Now you've got truth in there and there's other stuff and you don't know what to believe. Well, it, uh, it had come out. Um, I didn't vet this source, but uh, completely. Uh, but that he was repeating the Israeli uh, defense uh, security guy. He was repeating what he was told by his granddaughter and that his granddaughter was interested in these subjects and he wasn't speaking in first person. He was just relating what his granddaughter had told him. That was that that's sometimes the problem. Paul Heller had that problem. I dealt with Paul Hellyer in the 1970s, long before he became interested in UFOs, because he was involved. I don't know if you know the story. He was involved in a big case in 1967 in Canada where he opened a UFO uh, landing base. It was a centennial project, uh, a thing that this town had built this uh, right, tourist right. attraction, UFO landing base outside of St. Paul, Alberta. And he went and gave this, this speech there, July the 1st, 1967. And it was across the front page of all newspapers in Canada. And it said... Um, uh, he, he said, you know, this isn't the first time we've had a UFO landing base. We built a UFO landing base in 1954 and nothing landed. Therefore, UFOs don't exist. So, of course, through the 1970s, me and a researcher out of Ottawa were chasing them. And we wanted to say, like, OK, Paul, like, so how do the aliens know where to land? I mean, you can have this story, but if you open the base, the aliens have to know where to, where to land. There, there has to be some communication. And so I went to uh, Wilbert Brockhaus Smith's wife. He had died, but his wife was still alive. And I said to her, I said, hey. Uh, take a look at this story here. Was uh, Wilbur involved in this? And she read the story and she said, oh, yeah, it was Wilbur. And what had happened was Wilbur Smith had said in 1954, if you uh, stop trying to shoot this thing down, I'll get this alien by the name of AFA. And AFA was an alien that actually was channeled at the CIA um, um, by uh, Arthur Lundahl, who uh, Jacques Vallée was talking about in, in his latest interview with uh, Joe Rogan. And so... Um, he, he they, they had this agreement with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the uh, the cabinet and the military. And in the end, they would they, the cabinet would not give 100 percent guarantee they were allowed to take off again once it had landed. So Wilbur said, that's it. OK, we're calling it off. We're not we're not going to do anything. And so that's how the story happened. They, they had it actually opened up that Wilbur was going to have this thing land there and he couldn't get the, the agreement that he wanted to to allow this thing to take off after the in, encounter with the officials took place. And um, so Paul had the story. So then I, he was he was um, I, I put he said that he got the story from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police guy who was the expert for the Defense Department. And he really didn't look at UFOs. He wasn't really interested in UFOs. He was the defense minister, but he had seen some reports, but he wasn't interested or whatever. And um, so when I talked to him in, in Washington, he actually said to me, he said, you know, I, I didn't write that speech and, and I don't remember giving the speech. And uh, so he was sort of defending the fact that he really didn't know anything. But what happens is he gets the Corso book and he's reading it at his, his cabins north of Toronto. And his son-in-law comes along and his son-in-law says, what are you reading that garbage for? That, that's nonsense, whatever. And he said, it is. And, and then he puts the book down and then the son is working for this general. So this two-star general. And he asked the general, well, my father-in-law is reading this stupid book about Corso. And he says, and that's when he says, well, it's real. 
So then Paul Hellyer phones the two-star general, and that's when the general says it's all real and more. And then Paul goes off the deep end. Then he, then he, everything that he hears, he's he's basically repeating what everybody else is is, is saying, but he's not really vetting the the material the way you and I would vet the material. And so he's repeated a lot of these stories as well, and it's worked to our benefit because he's this very powerful guy, and a lot of people give credibility to UFOs because he's talking. Well, yeah. But, let me but, let me jump in right there. I got to take a break. Okay, got to take a break. I got I to gotta pay the bills there, Grant. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Grant Cameron. This is our second to last show in 2020. Only the best will do for all of you. Tonight, Grant Cameron, I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. More with Grant after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, my name is Billy Carson, and I am a best-selling author and the founder of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Together with my team, we have built an all-new conscious streaming TV platform designed with every family member in mind. If you have ever wanted to travel the world and attend lectures and workshops from your favorite speakers but weren't able to, look no further. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. There are dozens of workshops and lectures from speakers you know and love. We have also included amazing categories to assure that your consciousness is entertained and elevating on a daily basis. Amazing interviews, ancient history, ascension knowledge, wisdom teachings, documentaries, conspiracies, mysteries, health and fitness, conscious cooking, meditations, finance, yoga, and so much more. To start your free trial on any mobile device or computer, surf to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's Forbidden Knowledge with the number four, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Again, visit ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Hello, I'm and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. 
everybody. We are also Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright-Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Grant Cameron is here. Tomorrow night, Dr. Stephen Greer, our last show of 2020. Today, with Grant, we're talking about, you know, what went down in 2020, and a lot did, and we closed out the year pretty crazy uh, in the UFO community, so we'll be talking about all of that, and then, of course, what we can expect in 2021. And we were talking about, right before the break, uh, Grant, uh, Paul Hellyer. And the more that this is just me, you may know more about this, but did Paul gather his information uh, from the Internet, right? Yeah. Or from Corso's book? Uh, is is that what we're actually dealing with here? Yeah. Yeah. He got he just basically was listening to stories people were telling him. He did have one story that um, so he had the story that he talked to this general, the two star general. That was one thing that he had for sure. The other thing he had, we were at a conference in Ontario and they were asking him, they said to him, who in Canada would know, like who in the government would know what's going on that's been read in? And he said, well, the head of the Privy Council, he's naming these different things. And you could tell he really didn't know. And uh, so it went around and it was like a citizen's hearing, except they were using reporters. So it came around the second uh, round of questions. And that at that point, Paul's sitting right beside me and he tells this very bizarre story. He says, you know, I, I do know one guy that 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 knows that would know. And he said, I got this phone call from a guy in the Air Force. And he said uh, the, the the former head of emergency management, and that would be the head of your FEMA. The, he's he's dying of ALS of Lou, Gehr- Lou Gehrig's disease, and he's got something he wants to get off his chest. And he's decided you're the guy he wants to talk to. And I'm thinking, wow, it's like and, and so he says, uh, I, I don't phone the guy. And I said I'd phone him, but I didn't phone him. And then the Air Force guy phones Paul back and he says, Paul, he's about to go off the cliff. You better give him a call. So he phones him and the guy says, uh, I just want to let you know it's for real. I, this is for real. I actually was right in. I was taken to uh, Langley. I assigned my life away and I was actually taken to Area 51 and I actually sat in one of the crafts. And um, so this is a, a deathbed confession thing that he'd given to Paul Hellier. So those two stories he had, but the rest of it, he was just sort of picking up from, from people. And I guess like all of us, I and mean, we were, we're picking up and we're trying to, um, you know, sort out what it, what's going on. But Paul, you know, he, he, a lot of people criticized him because, you know, some of the stuff was really far out stuff that he was sort of buying into, but in terms of his private, his, his personal stuff, he just had the general, he had that incident with the head of emergency management. And he said, he saw a couple of sighting reports come across his desk when he was the defense minister, but he really wasn't interested in it. Very interesting. I, I always thought that about Paul. Um, I never had him on the show because I felt that, you know, firsthand, uh, you, you know, real like this guy from Israel. Uh, is this a first, you know, first person uh, uh, situation? The, the Israeli security uh, chief, he never said I, you know, he never said I was part of these negotiations with Israel and ET. I was part of this. I was, you know, he never said that. It was, um, it was all in the third person. So I just thought, ah, there's something funky here. So um, the the one story that that is big that I think everybody's overlooked because I'm the president guy. Uh, when a president talks, I listen very carefully. And Obama made a statement, which is one of the most powerful statements that any president's ever made. 
And that's when he's he's talking and he's being interviewed. And he talks about he was asked the question, have you ever been refused any information? And you know, that's a big question in the UFO community. Does the president know? Is the president read in or is he told, uh, shut up, you know, we'll, you know, we'll kill you if you, uh, you know, don't, you know, move to the side or whatever. And I always I move back and forth. The president knows the president doesn't know. And I always pointed out that that uh, the president doesn't have a security clearance that all security stuff goes through the president of the United States uh, through the executive office of the president. He's the guy that hands out the security clearances and he's the head of state. So if you're negotiating with foreign power, with aliens, you have to have the head of state. You can't use some lower level person. And there was five different reasons that indicated the president had to be a part of it. So when Obama's asked the question, were you ever refused information? And he said, no. And he, and then the guy of course immediately says, well, what about the UFO stuff? And he said, yeah, I looked for it, which indicates, yes, he found it. And that's when he said, well, are you, uh, he said, okay, I'm not going to talk, I can't talk about it. And then he stated that it took a, a lot of uh, power, a lot of, a lot of work to get it out of the bowels of the Pentagon. And that's what I've always said is that you may have people in there. You've got to find the guy who's got the information because you know what it's like. There's all these different departments and whatever that is maybe the president has to find the guy. But I, I remember there was an interview that that Fox had done with with Podesta. And I'm pretty sure Podesta used that word, those words as well. Well, on a six hundred billion dollar establishment like the Pentagon, there's you know, he talked about the bowels like they would be deeply hidden. And it's almost like Podesta went on this this track. So, I mean, I'm interested in next year. Uh, Obama's files are coming open. And um, uh, so it's FOIA. It's first come, first serve. And I will be first in line. I guarantee you I will be filing at twelve oh one in the morning. And I will have all the questions about Podesta's conversations, UFOs and this sort of stuff, because he indicated basically said, I can't talk about it. And uh, Bush had the same thing when he was questioned by um, uh, the, the night to, to, tonight show. He said the same thing. They said, you know, did you go look for the UFO information when you got sworn in? And then he said, oh, my daughter's asked me the same question. And then he said, what do you tell your daughter? Nothing. So you're not telling us anything, not telling you nothing which indicates the president does know. And that I think a lot of people slipped over that. The fact that Obama was very, he's always been interested. We know that he's been interested in UFOs. Podesta was in there. Podesta was his chief uh, counsel guy who could talk to him. His records are exempt. He could privately talk to the president for a whole year. And then when, when, when a Podesta said, he said, once again, my biggest disappointment in 2014 was not getting UFO disclosure as if he talked to Clinton about it and Clinton wouldn't do it and Obama wouldn't do it. And that they had actually found the documents. And so that indicates that if that's true, that the president knows and he's keeping secret, that indicates that whatever the secret is, the people believe that it's legitimately classified and there is a national security reason for not talking about it. The uh, one of the other big stories that I want to get to TTSA uh, in, in a second. Uh, one of the other big stories of the year was Maje, Brazil that a UFO crashed down there. The United States military was dispatched to go and recover this craft. Uh, a lot of uh, pretty crazy videos were were put out there on the net. Some of them uh, were scrubbed from the net. Uh, it was a pretty huge breaking story and then nearly immediately uh, died on the vine. What do you think ultimately happened down in Maje, Brazil? I don't know. I was sort of following it. I had a guy who I was going to interview who claimed he was working on it. He was there. Um, that's the thing is um, the ability to shut it down. The same thing happened in Virginia where they uh, there was a story about Virginia where the uh, NASA came in and that there was this agreement to put a uh, Brazilian on the space uh, space shuttle and uh, in exchange for the bodies and, and that kind of stuff that the Americans hold an awful lot of power around the world. They can cut off people's military budgets, their economic budgets. They can exempt a, a pile. And and so there may be a deal where the American, whoever is running the thing, wa walks in there because they would have a plan. And that, that's what people sort of forget all the time is that the government plans everything. They're, they're not going to sit there and wait for a crash to and then start working on plans of how we're going to recover the craft or whatever. They've been working on this forever and they would have a plan. So I think what, what probably happens is they, they walk in. They grab all the material and they exchange information with the top level people. We'll exchange the material, but we can handle it. You don't have the resources to do it. 
And if you don't go along with this, uh, you're going to lose all your defense budget. You're going to we're going to, you know, blackball you and whatever they're going to say. And uh, a smaller country will immediately fold and hand it over because people always ask me. I've, I've been in Canada. I, I know from 50 to 54, the Canadians worked on it and um, then they, they shut it down. And people ask me, well, who's running it in Canada? And I go, I haven't got a, I haven't got the clue because they don't, they don't talk about it. And I think that's what the Canadians have done is you all you need is one guy in each department to pass the material up to the top. You don't need everybody to know what's going on. You have these sort of moles in each each department that move the material. And I have no clue in 45 years. I have no clue what the what the Canadian government is doing. I have no clue who knows what's going on, except Paul Haller telling, telling the story about the head of emergency management, which, which makes sense. If there's a crash. The head of emergency management is going to have all the contingency plans, put money in the banks, all these contingencies for floods, you know, nuclear war, all these kind of things. And that would be a guy. It made sense that that guy would be read in. But I have no clue. I have no no idea. And that's why it's so interesting. in The United States is everybody's leaking. Everybody's talking. And every other country, it's completely silent which would indicate that the Americans are running the show, that the Americans have it and they are controlling, they are, they're putting out the leaks. They're putting out all that kind of stuff that they have sort of been handed the, the, the UFO situation. And it may be because the, the huge American military that the, uh, the intelligence behind the phenomena is interacting with the U S because they're upset about the nuclear weapons. They're upset about the military and that's why you have so many so many engagements with the U.S. military and UFOs. Yeah, I had uh, uh, two or three people down in in Brazil that uh, was feeding me information, and it was it was pretty good uh, while the case was out there. And then the information just stopped, and I think one of the email addresses uh, went bad, but the correspondence just stopped. It was it was just really strange. Now, let's say it's all a hoax, like it was just a made up story. Well, I didn't even get hoaxed information back, right? <laughs> I, I didn't get anything though. The the entire case was shut down. Uh, that's that's I mean that's the problem I always have with these hoax stories is, uh, and I, I know Steve was 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 saying this disinformation thing about the Israeli guy, and I'm going like this this never makes any sense to me because. There just is no researchers. There's nobody. There's there's who are they di uh, disinforming? Uh, there's not that many researchers. We think that you know everybody's interested, but you know that if you go talk to your friends and relatives, they listen to you because they know oh Jimmy's into UFOs, Grant's into UFOs. Don't argue with Grant about UFOs because he'll talk till you fall over. So people will sit there, but you can see their eyes rolling back. Most people are just not interested in UFOs, and because you and I have had sightings or we've had you know encounters and stuff like that. But if you're you're if you're disinforming, who are you really disinforming? It seems strange that you would go through all that work to throw off a hundred people. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that story broke, and it broke big. Um, but to uh, scrub the videos from the internet and things started getting uh, deleted, I thought that that was very strange. If it's just a hoax, and I was yeah. never able to put all of the pieces together. Well, let's talk about TTSA for a second. You mentioned uh, before the break, and we'll spend some time on this uh, for sure. Uh, you um, you said that your take on TTSA may not be that popular. Okay, so let's uh, let's actually start here. Uh, we okay. have Lou Elizondo, we have Chris Mellon, we have Steve Justice that now have all left TTSA. Uh, let's yeah. let's start there. What went through your mind when when the news broke? Had they signed the money for the for the task force immediately? I had a I had a panel. I put on a panel. I brought on a bunch of people. I brought on the guy who did the TTSA app, and I basically said, "Okay, did they sign the thing?" Because to me, uh, they're just shuffling the deck. There's we always sort of look at it from the surface, and we don't realize all this stuff is probably planned. Even the thing with how TTS started, I, and it, and it was done on your show. You got the 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 scoop on this whole thing, where Tom talks about how it, how it started. Everybody thinks, oh, Tom DeLong started TTSA, and he gathered all these people together, and they, uh, you know, he's this smart guy, and he's the Messiah. And I'm going like, come on. When he was on your show, he talked about it. He went to to he he gets contacted by that guy to go to the the um they know he's interested in UFOs. Oh, do you want to come to uh, Lockheed Skunk Works to the uh, little barbecue we're having here, and you can introduce the the president. I mean, can you talk about a hook being dangled in front of Tom DeLong? And of course he goes, well, I'll go if I can talk to the guy for five minutes. And he goes on to a Lockheed skiff. 
you do not, if you're a rock star, in a, you do not get into a Lockheed skiff where there's top secret stuff and, and they go there and then he's doing his pitch and then the guy says to him, oh, this might actually work. And so what happens? He's, he's the Lockheed skiff. They say, oh, we want you to meet these two guys in Washington. They send him to Washington and these two guys are in this in this room and they say, oh, with the, you know, this doesn't happen in the White House. It doesn't happen in Congress. It happens when guys like us decide to move the football down the field. And then they talk to him. And then, then he goes to Nassau and he talks to Nassau. They send him to Ames. Ames sends him to the general. And then they send him to the other general. And they just move him around. And it's like it's the same story as, as Bill Moore. We're from the government here and we'd like to help you. And you're going to help. You will help you and you help us. So they set this whole thing up for him. All the witnesses, all these guys that were put in into Tom DeLonge's hands, he didn't find these guys. And so you you look at it as if this is like a, a, a government operation. So when they left, because the other guys left, like Bill, um, Kit Green was sort of related to them. Uh, he was actually the guy that brought Hal Putoff into TTSA. And then he left and he and, and Nolan seemed to get money from the Defense Department to work on this this study on experiencers, on their DNA and on the brain patterns and stuff like that. And they they pulled out. But as soon as I saw that these three guys had left and, and the people I had on, some of them said, I knew this about six months ago. And I said, OK, so why do you say they left? Well, this is what we really don't know. And I said, well, did they sign the money? Because what TTSA did, they went to TTSA and Tom DeLong says at one point, everybody says, oh, Lou Alexander was frustrated, he retired, and then they were going to give me the document. I said, well, let's see the document. I, I don't believe this happened. They sent me the, the, the Lou Alexander resignation document, and it's got two misspellings in it. It doesn't have a date on it. So how do you resign if you haven't got a date on your resignation letter? And it was, it was addressed to the Secretary of Defense. You don't resign to the Secretary of Defense. You resign to your boss. And so I, I saw this, and, and Tom DeLong says, at one point he said, and I've got on tape, I still have to find it, he said, I hired him away. And so you have this whole situation where he's, the story is, oh, he's, he's frustrated, he's, uh, he's, he's quit the, the job, and then they walk out with the videos. And I said, okay, so how do they get the videos out? When you retire in disgust from the Department of Defense, they don't give you a pile of visit, videos as a goodbye president as you're leaving. They, they just say, don't let the door hit you on the way out. They're not going to give you a bunch of stuff. So how do they get the videos out? And at, all the time, it was the same thing. It's framed. It's framed. They're leaking this stuff. They're using these people. So when these three guys left, I go, they're going back. And, and you saw that George Knapp, you heard the interview. George Knapp says to them, he said, Lou, so if you had a chance to go back, uh, would you go back? And Lou goes, yeah, I might go back. And it's like you can tell this is this is a setup question that he's he's going. And he says he says we we need to, well he asked him why are you leaving? He says, Well, we've got it, we've done that. I'm not a a, a, a guy who goes into Hollywood and that kind of stuff. That's not my job. Uh we did it. We we have to get into second gear. And tonight he posts on Twitter. This is what he said on, on Twitter. Congratulations to all. So he's, he's again, he's disgusted. He's left the thing, but he's all happy. Congratulations to all. It appears that the Senate bill funding the task force. Uh, uh, was passed. Job well done by all. Special thanks to D. Johnson for keeping us appraised. Great start for now being in second gear. That's exactly what he said on the interview with George Knapp. We need to move to second gear. So what is the second gear? And I always said and th that what this whole thing with the Senate was, it was about moving this thing into the white world and getting some money. And everybody's going to walk away with suitcases full of money. Uh, you can't, there's no money for research. And TTSA was the front that went in to do all this job, to move the Senate, to uh, put the fear of God into them, to say this is a threat, that we need we need this money. And as soon as they, they did the task force thing and the money started to clear, it's, then immediately their job was done at TTSA. And the, I believe they're moving back and they're moving back into the government. So uh, Elizondo is, uh, I, I did my little crystal ball about this last week, and I said that uh, Elizondo would go to the UAP task force. Chris Mellon's going to go um, into the Biden administration. There's been no yeah. announcement about that. Um, so you're, you're saying that Lou is probably, or has he uh, uh, officially been moved over to the uh, task force? But as with everything, you're never going to know what their real job is. They're they're going to be going back, and they're 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 being being brought back. But again, um, this is all sort of under the weather. You never know. Like, did Lou really resign? Um, you know, what was he doing at TTSA? 
so I don't think you're really going to know if it by if Biden appoints um, Mellon as in some position, you know that. But a lot of it, it's going to be classified that this is what they wanted. This they wanted this thing moved out. So I'm not sure what kind of position it's going to be an advisor, and and still TTSA is going to be linked into this kind of stuff. Because one of the things I brought up in in the um, the uh, the whole thing of them leaving was they're leaving everything behind. It's the same thing as the videos. They when you walk out, they walked out with these videos. But when you see what happened in TTSA, the, I had the guy who built the app for them, this this app where they've got the artificial intelligence and you put the, the thing on your cell phone and, and all it, and it logs all these UFO sightings and stuff like that. The guy that built it, I said to him, I said, it was Rob Freeman. I said, Rob, so when you signed the deal, did you sign the deal with Lou Elizondo or did you sign the deal with TTSA? And he said, no, I signed the deal with TTSA. So that app, all that stuff, they're leaving behind. They're, they're walking out and all the metal material, all the, and the analysis, all the material, they're walking away with nothing. And uh, they wouldn't be walking away unless there was, I think, some sort of agreement with an exchange with TTSA with the, because they had that deal with the army. So there's these inter, uh, the, the army will help them, the government will help them, TTSA will uh, have this app and stuff like that, because they walked away with nothing. And so it, it doesn't make sense that they would leave all that material, work and build this app and, and get all this uh, material and analysis and bring in Eric Davis and all this kind of stuff and then just walk away from it. There has to be some sort of thing that there's still some sort of link. So it's not what I'm saying is it's not what it looks like because Tom DeLong was posting today. He's all happy. Um, um, Mellon went on a show today. He's all giving people updates. It's like this is just the next step. It's like it's it's been planned for months. As soon as that money comes through, as soon as the task force, our job is done and we're going back. Are you suggesting, and that's very interesting, that it's possible that Elizondo never officially resigned? Well, he always said he had no security clearance. I'm just saying that the no, letter— No, I'm talking about from the DOD, that he never resigned from the DOD while he was working with TTSA? Well, that was the thing that they never produced a letter that actually, to me, showed that that he had actually resigned. Or if you see the thing, if you look at the 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 the, the whole story with um, the New York Times, if you see Leslie Kane's write up about it, she was told to go to Washington. That's when they met Lou Elizondo, and she said there was a bunch of intelligence people in the room, not just Lou Elizondo. And that was the day he resigned, which would indicate the meeting had to be set up before he resigned. So this was all in the works. And then you get all these other things, these other back channel things like um, Jim Semivan. And I've told, the, I don't know if you know the story about Jim Semivan. Jim Semivan's an experiencer. He had the experience in the 1990s. And the, I have a very good source that I trust that told me that when he had that ex experience, he went to Ron Pendolfi, who's rumored to be the guy that runs the weird desk at the CIA. And he said, Ron, me and my wife had this experience. These beings were in the room last night and I need to know what's going on. And Ron says, you don't have a need to know. He said, I don't have a need to know because he was head of uh, covert ops. And he said, I don't have a need to know. I'll tell you what, you bring your boss's boss in here. We'll see who doesn't have a need to know. And they brought, they brought in, I heard the, the director of CIA came in and said, Jim, leave it alone. Don't touch it. Pretend it's a one-off. This will ruin your career. Don't, don't go down this road. And what I was told is that when Jim Semivan left, uh, Ron Pandolfi uh, briefed him as to what's going on. And that's what Kit Green says, that you don't have the security clearance very high when you're in the government. But as soon as you leave and go into a, to a private contractor, that's when you get this, the, the briefing and the security clearance and all that kind of stuff. So you see that. And then just recently, that, that tape I was talking, that, that Kit Green tape, the guy who leaked the tape, I, just in the last couple of days, had sent a an email to Ron, and he's always bugging Ron. They play this game like they're fighting or whatever. And he said, you should go back and 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 talk to the Senate Intelligence Committee again. And as soon as I said that, I said, oh, my goodness. If Ron was called in, because that's what happened. If you remember back in the Clinton days, when uh, Clinton was going to be approached with the UFO thing with Lawrence Rockefeller, they cut him off at the pass, and they went to the um, the science advisor and the science advisor knows nothing about UFO, so he says, oh, I need a briefing. So they go to the CIA for a briefing, and Ron Pendolfi is supposed to do a briefing for the science advisor to the president, and he can't do it. So he brings in um, um, a UFO researcher to do the briefing, because he can't. He can't say the UFOs uh, are CIA type stuff. And so then you see this whole thing, and, you, and I've always said, is Ron running this whole thing? Because he keeps saying it's a TTS, it's a scam, it's a techno scam. And that basically is, is uh, I think, partly true. He's always had the same sort of... Uh, statement, but I heard that he may have briefed the Senate Intelligence Committee. Then it's like, well, maybe they're all working together. They pretend they're fighting and this kind of stuff. But if Ron was brought in and briefed, 
then he's part of this whole thing, this task force thing. And he's playing like he's a skeptic and stuff like that. And he even when when the, I remember the day when TTSA had the, the opening thing in October of 2017, I was with Dan Smith, who was Ron Pendolfi's friend. I said, hey, hey Khan, watch this. They're, they're going to do this news conference. He went on and I said, ask Ron, ask Ron what's going on. And the first thing that he said, Ron says, oh, ah, yeah. he said, that's that's a big uh, techno scam. I know all those guys. Lou, uh, Mellon's been in this since the 1980s. And he said, I knew all those guys. And and they're they're trying to scam. And it's the whole idea that they're 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 playing the game that they're 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 trying they're trying to get money out of Congress. And they they ran through the billionaires and Ron would name these different billionaires that they they took money off and now they run out of billionaires and now they're going after Congress and they're trying to get money from Congress and uh, so if if Ron is part of this thing if he's done the the briefing and these other guys are going back this whole thing where he's saying oh these guys are a bunch of scam artists and whatever it, they all may be working because uh, Semivan we asked Semivan the question like why why would Ron uh, you know distance you. And say that you didn't exist because I brought up I was the guy that discovered Jim Semivan. And when I brought it up, Ron Pendolfi had said, no, the guy doesn't exist. There's no such guy. And then I started showing photographs and they said, oh, yeah, he does exist. But that's not his name. And they were playing these games. I'm going, why would Ron Pendolfi deny that the, the existence of Jim Semivan? Because maybe Jim Semivan's working for him. And that's the whole thing. That's why I'm saying what you're looking at at the surface. There's a lot of moving parts behind the surface. And if you go back through UFO history, you'll see it over and over again, whether it was Bill Moore or whether it was uh, Emmenager, you see this leak, put it out, pull it back, put it out, uh, cover the cover the stuff. And that they've been leaking stuff since the, uh, well, even Disney was offered a, a documentary, he did a documentary and they pulled the videos at the very, the videos and the photographs in 1956. They've been doing this over and over again. And it's to control the story. And um, th this last bit is about the money. It's getting money from Congress and TTSA didn't have any money. So uh, TTSA is not going to build a flying saucer, but uh, Congress has got a $700 billion budget. They're not going to miss $10 billion or $15 billion. And, and that's where you go after Congress to get the money from Congress. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Grant Cameron, live from Canada, taking a look back to 2020, what went down and what is in the future. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black, KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzonel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo, Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Old New England Soap is committed to producing the highest quality organic and goat milk soaps available anywhere. We take pride in using the purest ingredients and avoiding the typical shortcuts used by other soap makers. Because goat milk is what feeds your skin, we have formulated our soap to use the maximum amount of goat milk possible, 38%, more than double any other brand. Not because it's easy, but because our soap is always better. We are proud to offer you what we consider to be truly premium quality handmade soaps. What's more, our soap does not contain GMO ingredients, pesticides, sulfates, dyes, artificial colors, alcohol, or petroleum products. Try our new shampoo bar and pooch soap, and be sure to see all of the great scented Woodwick soy candles that burn soot-free for up to 100 hours. Right now, save 15% on your order and get free shipping on orders over $45. Buy now at oldnesoap.com. That's oldnesoap.com. Not available in stores. oldnesoap.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. 
You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com Telepath is a weekly digital newsletter filled with the latest paranormal news, trending topics, and fresh articles from some of the most popular critical thinkers in the community today. Stay informed on your favorite paranormal podcasts and live streaming talk shows. Interact with the telepath and upload your paranormal story or pics. It could be featured in an upcoming edition. Sign up right now for the free telepath newsletter at paranormal.radio. That's paranormal.radio. Including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app. Free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Grant Cameron is here. Before we get back to Grant, there are suggestions that our credit scores might be based on our internet history in the near future. The same way banks use data like income to judge credit eligibility now is how websites could use internet search history in the future. Researchers studying the relationship between finance and tech found that data from your browsing, your search history, and purchase history could be used to decide your credit in the future. If you want to prevent this from happening to you, use the best VPN you can have right now to protect your search history. Separate you from your personal data. I highly recommend using Virtual Shield. All of it is easy to do. You can go to virtualshield.com forward slash fade to black and get registered right now. Or you can click on the link in the video description box below, and you can go and check out Virtual Shield. I use Virtual Shield for all of these computers that you are looking at right now. Virtual Shield VPN. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Grant Cameron is with us. We were just talking before the break, uh, Grant, about TTSA. Now that we have the exodus of Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and Steve Justice, where does that leave TTSA moving forward? Yeah, well, they're, I guess their job is done. I mean, uh, one of the things one of the panel people pointed out was that they, they still have all the, the rights to all the, the movies and the books and all that kind of stuff. Tom was never a research guy. He was always the Hollywood guy to do that kind of stuff. And there's still maybe some agreements uh, where stuff's going to flow in there, but I I I can't really see because that's the three main guys. I call them the three magi that have, have walked out. I mean that's their three key guys. And Green has left, and Nolan's no longer associated. And um, so what have they got? They really don't have anything except the the Hollywood thing, which to do. But I think. Um, there's still going to be connections. The other thing I, I forgot to mention that you got to remember when you're looking at why did these guys leave? Um, now, Mellon and um, Justice maybe have enough money. I don't think Lou Elizondo has got money. So when they leave, you always have to look at, well, who's going to who's going to pay them? Where are they going? They got to be getting, getting a job somewhere. And that's where, again, it sort of supports the fact that uh, when w- and the, the bill hadn't been signed at that point. That's when I said. To everybody and there was a kind of a debate on the, the panel i said is this is money flowing yet is this what's going on here is this thing because that was to me the the immediate thing and now they're you know it's it's close or signed or whatever and and the other thing you've got stephen greer is is this connection with all these people in the background that you always have to look at the people in the background um because um 
Stephen Greer uh, was dealing with Ron Pendolfi, so he may have um, an insight on on what's going on there. He's uh, he, he's not very public about it, but he has uh, with Ron, same as Ron, sort of indirectly sends through stuff through to me. And there's all these uh, things in behind the scenes that just looking at the surface, you really can't see. So it may look like TTSA is out of business, but I'm sure this has all been planned for many, many months and that the main objective of TTSA was a front to uh, move this thing to Senate to get the money and to get uh, White World funding for this thing. Uh, I'll have uh, Dr. Greer on the show tomorrow, and I will ask him just that. Um, and there's the other part. I mean, does TTSA just, you know, remain as an entertainment company only and and no research? I mean, how put off uh, appears to still be there. Um, no word from Hal yet uh, about uh, where he's going to be with TTSA moving forward. But if they just uh, uh, turn into an entertainment company only, then the Pentagon's not going to really have anybody to leak to, right? So is is that just it? Just an entertainment company, books, movies, and TV? Well, but 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 after Tom did the interview with you, where he sort of messed up, and then when he did the Rogan interview, that he's never made a statement since then. It's always been Lou Elizondo that's doing the leaking. Lou Elizondo, like even now, did you handle uh, material? Did you handle hardware? Well, come on, George, what are you, what are you doing? Like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I did. You know, and and he's leaking all this material. He's been the spokesman for TTSA for a number of years, so they're not. Tom has really not said much, but Tom is posting today too. He seems to be in a good mood. He doesn't seem to be too disturbed by anything that's going on. And Mellon doesn't seem to be disturbed, as if this has all sort of been in the in the cards. And that's why I say to people, be very cautious. I think it's way more complex than what, what you think is going on in terms of what are these guys actually doing and who are they working for? Because you're never going to figure it out. You're never going to know who pays the bills, uh, who's in behind the scene. I've always thought that Ron Pandolfi has a, a key figure in this whole thing, and and yet you can't really prove it. So you're just sort of guessing. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure they know what they're doing, that there's a step two. Like even now he's saying uh, we've moved to second gear, and that's what he was saying in the interview. We've gone past first gear. Now we're moving. We're in second gear. And that all has to do with the signing and the, getting this this uh, task force report that the Navy is now working on this and it's out in the open and he can, uh, you know, release the material that they he'll be their spokesman or he'll still be talking. I'll guarantee you him and Mellon. Me Mellon is it's he's he's always wanted this kind of stuff. Justice is just after the technology. But the other two are they're They're bought into this issue and they, they want it out. And uh, they're not going to quit talking. They, they don't need the TTSA label behind them. And they, they haven't really used it for a long time. Tom has really not said anything for a couple of years. No, but they are a public benefit corporation. Uh, they sold stock. What happens with the investors? Well, yeah, that's that's a problem because uh, we had um, a guy who was a financial guy that, that talked about, and this is a number of months ago already, that they were in financial trouble already. And so that's the, the, the one of the reasons I thought might be as well is that they really didn't have the money to pay um, Lou Elizondo anymore, that the, the, it wasn't financially viable. Because where, where are you going to go with it? You can't, and, and, but it didn't make any sense at first because you know that they wanted $50 million in the initial offering. They only got $2.2 million. And then the rumor I heard is they only got a million out of that. So they really didn't have any money. It was sort of Tom's money. They're not going to build a flying saucer. So um, anybody that thinks that, they're suddenly going to have some technology and build a flying saucer. They didn't have any money before. Now they're really not going to have any money and no investor is going to go near them now. So I would say, you know, basically the money is, is gone. I don't know what they're going to, whether they fold it or what they're going to do, but um, there, there's, there's really nothing left in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the stuff that people invested on. It's a, uh, it's such a very interesting situation because, okay, sure. We have Lou, uh, Chris and and Steve to talk about those three guys, but then you have the rest of the world in the community that uh, emotionally invested into TTSA, and to have the rug and carpet you know pulled out once again underneath uh, the UFO community with a big pile of disappointment here, and I think that should be something that needs to be addressed directly. Um, you build up all of this momentum and all of this hope. And uh, big chunks of the community 
are are there propping up TTSA and supporting them in in social media and and watching the television shows and and getting behind this, buying the books, and then all of a sudden, once again, poof, it it just disappears. Yeah, I, they lost the show. I I, I heard they were going to do a, a statement, but I, as far as I know, there's been no statement from TTSA yet from the people that whoever's left there. And it would basically just be, uh, you know, uh, um, semi van put off and Tom DeLong and a couple of these CIA people that they have. Uh, other than that, they really, they don't. So I can see people are going to be upset, but then of course people move on and say, Oh man, now we got this task force. And that's the new big story is, is the task force going to save us? They're the Messiah now. And they're all this stuff's going to come out. There's the, the first report before 2015 and they're going to have photographs and there's second part. Some of the stuff's starting to leak out already. And um, so people are sort of excited. Even the uh, some of the people I know that were big supporters are sort of moved on where, oh, this might be a good thing. I don't know if people had that much money invested. You know, a lot of people invested the 700 bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever. Uh, but um, yeah, they're, they're going to be um, they're going to be disappointed if they're thinking that TTSA is going to build anything. But th- that never made any sense beginning. If they'd gotten the 50 million dollars, that may have made sense. But it was like game over from from word go when they didn't get the money that they expected in the initial offering. Were you surprised that after everything in December 2017 and the New York Times article um, and with the Nimitz and the Roosevelt, um, that was the only thing pretty much that TTSA brought to the table? After that, for three years, it was the same story that was being covered. Nothing else fresh uh, was presented by TTSA, unless I missed something. Well, uh, that's the thing is to try to figure out what were they actually doing? Were they actually doing what everybody thought they were doing in terms of they're going to bring disclosure and this kind of stuff? Uh, because the the whole thing with the New York Times, and because I always point out to people, it wasn't the New York Times. It was the New York Times, Washington Post, and Political all went the same day, which meant that story was fed to them by the the Pentagon. It wasn't some reporters from the New York Times that broke this story. There was other reporters that were getting the story as well. So it, it comes down to it, it the, the they were given the initial story, and then it may have been an, an understanding that these guys were going to go to Congress and we need some money. We didn't get it through TTSA, and that's our job now. So you got to give them credit that, 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 that it's a totally different world after 2017, and I always maintain it was Hillary Clinton and Podesta that started the whole thing. And because Hillary lost the election, they had to retool the whole thing and wait eight months or 10 months to run the news conference. But this was in the works back in 2016. In fact, my book, Managing Magic, was written eight months before Tom DeLong went public. And I basically say exactly what they're going to do. And I was getting this material from the inside. And, and that's what happened. So you get you got to give them credit that they broke the story in 2017. It's a completely different world of UFOs. And they made this move that they moved Congress to get money and to actually have a study where they're hoping that there's going to be some sort of public acknowledgement uh, and place for people to to file. So I, I give them credit for the, the stuff they've done. And that may have been what they were initially intended to do all along. They'd everybody thought, oh, they're going to bring us disclosure. And they didn't have any intention of bringing us disclosure at all. It was a totally different mission because most of the mission in the last couple of years has been that hammering away the the the, the briefings, all that kind of stuff, bringing in like, you know, Davis and put off and and Lou Elizondo and doing the briefings and scaring the living daylights out of the Congress guys. And it's worked. They've got the money. They've, they've, they've got this 180 day thing. The reports are coming out. The money's flowing now. Everybody's going to be happy. Everybody's got a, you know, uh, some, some research money. And that's something we've never had in the UFO community. Now with the UAP task force, uh, do we have any idea what has been budgeted to the UAP task force? Do they actually have physical offices in the Pentagon? Is it staffed with human beings, or is this on paper only? Kind of like ATIP, right? And OSAP. You know, there wasn't an ATIP office at the Pentagon, right? Um, okay, I, 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 Lou may, did mention that he knows the guys who are running it, um, so which indicates that they are. The, they, the word that I sort of got was they had scraped some money together from old from other budgets and from past times to get going. Um, but um, 
in terms of what kind of budget they have, I haven't heard anything like that yet. I've just heard this 180 days. Everybody keeps talking about the 180 days that this report has to be released by the Senate Intelligence Committee or whatever. Into and, the public, uh, yes. Yeah, and that it'll have a classified annex and all this kind of stuff. But that's what everybody's betting on. And everybody just moves from one step to the next, the next hopeful or this and this. I think we're hard, I think we're farther ahead in the game than we were uh, a couple months ago. Definitely farther ahead than 2017. Uh, before 2017, we were still the Rodney Danger field of science. We are not anymore. They've they've at least done that. And for me, from my and I wrote about it before it happened. Um, I, the indication that I got that this was all set up, that um, Jim Semivan was partly behind getting this this these articles, him and Mellon in the New York Times. And that when Leslie Kane went, it wasn't just Lou Elizondo. There was a bunch of intelligence guys. Or you see the thing when when Jim when the, the story of of of, um, of uh, Tom DeLong, you know the story where uh, Jim Semivan finds out about him. He releases the 2016 book, and they suddenly go like, "What the heck is going?" And and they get him in a, a hotel room in San Diego. I don't know if he told that story on your show or where he told it, but they had they had six intelligence agents. So it was Ron, so it'd be Semivan and five other guys, and for two days. They were asking him, like, where'd you get this from? Where'd you get this from? And then, of course, what do they do? They arrest him, throw him in jail. No, they say, hey, okay, we'll help you. And they start feeding him. And that's the thing is everybody's sort of getting on the same page. And it's the government working through other people. And maybe Tom DeLong's job is done. In fact, he, I think he's been, he's not even really been doing UFOs. He's doing another album or something. I don't think he's really, and he's working on, on uh, you know, shows and stuff. I don't think he's really done much UFO. I've never really heard much in the last say year from him talking about UFOs or stuff. Cause I think they shut him down. He was, he was bad news. He was, you know, he would say things he shouldn't have been saying. And in a controlled operation, uh, he had, um, done his damage and they sort of, uh, pulled him out. He got caught, you know, putting these classified names in the, uh, the emails to Podesta. And then when the WikiLeaks released, then suddenly, uh, uh, the head of Lockheed Skunk Works and, uh, you know, McKay and McCaslin were all exposed as being involved in, and, and being part of this operation. And they all had to run for cover. So they've had some mistakes. But I think in, in the end, I think people are going to be pretty happy in terms of uh, that. We're fa that I think we're farther ahead than we were uh, years ago, despite all the problems that they've had, which may not be problems. They may actually be things that were planned all along. Now, uh, do you think that the Senate Intelligence Committee and the UAP task force are dealing with and investigating ET from off planet? Or is this only uh, put together to look at terrestrial technology? What do you think the understanding is for the establishment of the UAP task force? Well, one of the things that, that James Fox brought up about his documentary was at the end he had put in that thing with the uh, the African, with the kids, with the alien, and that he was afraid that that Reed was going to uh, withdraw his support for the movie because Reed doesn't want, he. if you heard Reed talk about it, former Senator Reed, he always says, okay, we want to look at the UFO, at the, you know, the Russians and the Chinese not getting it and that sort of stuff. And we don't want to talk about the little green men. And you see this all, the New York Times did the same thing. We're right. not we ain't mentioning aliens. We're not saying aliens. And so I think what you're going to get is, is a, a report that's basically Navy because you don't hear the Air Force, you don't hear any other agencies involved. It's the Navy and Defense Intelligence Agency, and it's going to be these encounters between the Navy, and they're going to have the same problem as Obama, that you've got to be able to find it. So if you're a senator, and I know there was a, a, an email that I had gotten with Ron Pendolfi, where and we're going to put it in a book called Alien Documents, which will be out maybe next year or whatever. And in there, it shows that he's definitely the 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 keeper of the of the secrets. He's the, he has the keys. And he basically says, you know, when I get a, when I get a request for a Senator briefing, I say to him, okay, here's, 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 I'll give you the keys, but just remember that when you go to get the information, you're now responsible for it. And he says, everybody just says, oh, okay, you handle the keys. And, and they, he backs off the senators by this. And so senators don't have as much power as the president that I think there's going to be a lot of stonewalling and almost like when you see back in the, in the Clinton days, when, 
uh, Congressman Schiff was trying to get it. And they basically sent him to the National Archives and stuff. The congressmen don't have as much power to fight. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's sort of a, a whitewash type thing where, but you've, you've at least got guys like Hal Putoff who've done the briefings there, uh, Eric Davis, and, and these guys who know that there's crash saucer material who are going to push. And if the Senate in, Intelligence Committee goes along with that and pushes along as well, you you may uh, you may get something. So at least they know you've got the right people briefing them. It's not just senators. If it was just senators without Lou Al, uh, without Lou Alzando and Eric Davis and put off, they'd be totally lost. They would not get anywhere. But these guys know sort of where all the bodies are buried, and they are going to be giving leaks. Go here, go there, look here. So you I mean, you never know. You may you may get something. And and you talk about Lou Alzano keeps talking about the crash saucer material now. So you may get some sort of confirmation that they have some hardware because he keeps talking about it. And he says he's got a security clearance and he's not violating his security clearance. So he must have some sort of authorization to be doing these little leaks about the fact that uh, you know there's there's there may be off world material in in hands of the U.S. government. Uh, I've got two minutes before the break. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is if I'm a reporter. Uh, for one of the networks, and I go up to Marco Rubio, and we're in the halls, right, uh, yeah. the Capitol building, and I say, you know, Marco, um, so what's going on with uh, the UFO uh, task force instead of UAP, right? And I say, what's yeah. going on with the UFO task force? And I flip them. He's, he, I'm not sure if his response is, oh, you mean UAP? No, we're not. We're not dealing with UFOs. It has nothing to do with ufos this has to do with foreign technology i think that would be the response or do you think he would come back with well yeah we're we're checking out flying saucers what do you think th the direct response would be from marco well they're they're going to play the cautious game they're going to say we really don't know what we're dealing with we're just this is unidentified that's the the read position this is just unidentified and we want to investigate uh what it is and and what's going on and we're not going to go to offward technology or aliens and stuff like that. He's going to be very cautious and say, we really don't know. And that may be the, the principle because I've uh, every time I go, we can talk about this later. Every time I go down this road, it appears like the end of the Wilson documentary. So it's just hoax. It says we've got offward. We've got technology. We've got crashes. We've got bodies. And we haven't got the foggiest notion what's going on. And that may be the truth. You may have gotten disclosure that they really don't know what this stuff is. They've got films. They've got bodies. They've got crafts. They can't turn the crafts on because they've got consciousness connection to it. And, and I keep seeing this over and over again that people think they've got all this technology and stuff. That may not be true. They may actually, the briefing that they gave to Trump may be the actual briefing. Mr. President, here's these videos. We've got these videos. These are real. They're unidentified. We don't know what they are. And Trump goes, yeah, I don't know. I don't believe it. Let's take it. Uh, yeah, let's take our break right here. I guess tonight, Grant Cameron. His website, presidentialufo.com. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can also follow Grant right here on Twitter at Grant Cameron. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Church Radio. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regimen until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. 
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. Let's face it, you've always wanted to do a sky watch and see your first UFO. Today, it's easy. Just get your own HP 7 3B Cobalt Jimmy Church Edition night vision goggles from Hoffman's Optics. This is the same U.S. military system that I use featuring a Generation 3 Blue Phosphor Image Tube. That's right, it's blue, not black and green. This is the only blue system in the world, and it's waterproof, lightweight, combat-proof, simple to use and ready to go. Hoffman's optics help create night vision sky watches. And now you can see what everyone has been talking about each night from your own backyard. Just call 760-231-9929. That's 760-231-9929. You can click on the banners on our site or visit ufonightvisiongoggles.com. That's ufonightvisiongoggles.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, available at orangeguard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Telepath is a weekly digital newsletter filled with the latest paranormal news, trending topics, and fresh articles from some of the most popular critical thinkers in the community today. Stay informed on your favorite paranormal podcasts and live streaming talk shows. Interact with the telepath and upload your paranormal story or pics. It could be featured in an upcoming edition. Sign up right now for the free telepath newsletter at paranormal.radio. That's paranormal.radio. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Grant Cameron is here. Our second to last show for 2020. Got to bring in the best. Brought in Grant. Tomorrow night, final show of 2020, Dr. Stephen Greer is with us. Now, uh, talking about some of these big stories of uh, 2020, Grant, and uh, ended the year with a bang when the debrief uh, released uh, the image uh, from a apparent classified uh, security document of an F-18 pilot and uh, of something that he took outside of his cockpit window. Uh, when you first saw the photograph, uh, what you, would you think you were looking at? <laughs> well, I always look at it the same way. So immediately I, I'm, I'm thinking, my father was a pilot, my son's a pilot. You don't take your cell phone on an F-18 you know, F- jet fighter. I mean, that was the first thing that was, and now tonight they've actually, like Debrief is involved in this again. They're talking again tonight that this thing was on the internet already. 
they've admitted this thing was on the internet already. When I saw it, I because we had we had had the story through Bob McGuire. And Bob McGuire had been on this submarine, and he knew this story about the triangle coming out of the water. Yes. And they were all upset about us because we went with the story. Bob told us the story. So when I saw it, I went, that doesn't look like a triangle coming out of the water beside a submarine or whatever. And the, the people have, have rated it as a, um, a Batman uh, Mylar balloon. I can guarantee you it's not, yeah, unless it's, it's Photoshop. Because I live in the coldest city in the world. And I know that when you take a Mylar balloon in very cold weather, you, it will deflate before you get it to the car. You walk out of the, the, the store and it'll deflate before you get to the car. And when you when you get back to your house, then it will inflate again. So this is that. So, of course, I immediately looked at 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet is 60 degrees below zero. If that's a Mylar balloon, it's not going to be nothing left of it. So it may have been something with Photoshop because it does look like a Batman balloon. So, but then you get into this all the all the the controversy. It's the same story. You have the controversy. Should he have had the cell phone? How do you you know what it's like if you've seen a plane go by on a when you're flying in a plane? It goes by. It looks like a bullet. Like how do you get it in the frame? And so it, to me, it's always this thing like, oh, okay. Suddenly they they release. Oh yeah, it was released already. It was on the internet. And then you're starting to think, set up, set up. How did the thing get out? They're even asking these questions tonight. How did it get out? Why is nobody in trouble over this thing? And it's the same story over and over again. And uh, okay, but you didn't answer my question. What do you think you were looking at? Um. I, I it was it wasn't a mylar balloon. I will say that um, it may it, it I don't know. I, I I have at first I thought it was exactly what they said it was because Bob McGuire said he'd seen it in classified channels, but that doesn't mean that they didn't float this thing in classified channels. Um, I I don't think it's um, I don't know. It it to me it's it's I I have more and more questions the more I look at it that this may have been a setup that they they put this out that would be my my estimate right now that i'm not sure that it's it's a ufo but it's not a mylar balloon that's for sure yeah. it may have been photoshopped and uh my issues with it and you brought up uh, a couple of them but at that altitude uh would a mylar balloon get up there that's the first thing i kind of checked that off the list the second thing is you can't really triangulate because you don't have anything in the background. You have the clouds that are below, but there's no way to figure out distance. So there's no real way to confirm its actual size without talking to the pilot directly. That's, that's all of your information. Just like the original TTSA videos, uh, those are just videos. They could be anything. It's the pilots and the crew members that support the story uh, for those three videos. We need the pilot to come forward to tell us what he saw. How far away was it? How big was it? How fast were you going? Was it moving? We need all of that information. And without the pilot's uh, direct report uh, and uh, the debrief <laughs> of the pilot, we really yeah. don't have anything here, do we? Yeah. Plus, we're missing the second photograph. So you see, you start to see these weird things happening. Like, uh, so uh, Valet and and Fox go on uh, Joe Rogan show when this story is breaking, and they read this statement. Oh, we'd like to see the other photograph. And they're 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 playing this, this sort of a thing where they read this statement from Mellon that he'd like the other photograph, and the other photograph is the most spectacular one, where it's it's actually coming out of the water and stuff like that. So it's 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 almost like the it's a replay of the Bob Lazar story. It looks good. Uh, there seems to be some truth to it, and then it all starts to fall apart. And and then all the researchers start fighting. Oh, it's a balloon. It's this. And they they did the same thing even with the Holman Air Force Base film. When when I first got the Holman Air Force Base, Bob Emenegger, who had the uh, had the film in his hands, who got the briefing, who read the notes. I uh, knew when it had taken place, who filmed it, all this kind of stuff. Said it was May of 1971. As soon as we went public with that story, Richard Doty came out and said, no, it was uh, April of 1964, and the aliens got in the wrong spot. They got confused, and they ended up uh, in, in the wrong spot, and it was it was filmed. And then, of course, now, so Linda puts out one story. I put out the other story. Now it's like Linda and I are, it's a big fight about who's who's right and who's wrong. So you always have this thing where they're putting out double stories, and you really can't get to the story. They're always the same thing. There's if and it's the old deal. It's if they want this thing out, they will stand up and release it officially with signature and stuff. 
It's all coming through the back door. The same thing as the, the Nimitz videos. You do not walk, even if they're unclassified, you do not walk out of the Pentagon with three videos. Someone got it out of there. And th then you had this stuff that leaked off of Mellon's uh, website, if you know that whole story. The, that, the Lou Elizondo resignation letter and the, the photograph of the, the discs that had the, the Nimitz thing. And on there is a, a name. And I actually had it checked by somebody that I had a contact with the Pentagon. And it, it was a woman. It was this Essex. Rhonda Essex was the woman's name. So then you start putting these pieces together that there was assistance to get these videos out of the Pentagon, that there is help from the inside. And th that's what people always leave out. They sort of just assume that, oh, yeah, they got the videos and they declassified them. And they brought them out. That's not how the process works. The same as this one, that the, the video, the, the photograph was out already. It was floating around. Same as the Nimitz was, was, was offered to this German production company in 2007. It was floating around a long time ago. They're leaking this stuff all the time, but they cover their tracks. It's always plausible deniability. You can never track it down. So they're telling the story without telling the story. Nobody can confirm any of the stories that are coming out. And we're building a whole worldview based upon Nimitz, based upon uh, this video, based, based upon this photograph, all this kind of stuff. And we can't prove any of it. Is the debrief the new TTSA? That could be. Yeah, exactly. They're, that's the thing. They're, they've, 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 in fact, Mellon went on there tonight talking to them. So they're the new sort of uh, spokespeople. Uh, they're more conservative in, in terms of how they handle the story. And it always comes down to this thing where you'll keep confidential sources. They were talking tonight to some of the people that are involved. Oh, well, we, have, we, we don't release the stuff because we're going to lose our sources. But the worst thing you can do in the UFO community is allow an intelligence officer to come to you and say, I'm going to give you a video, but keep my name confidential because he's got you for life. I've been made numerous offers and I've said no. I had one phone call from one of Ron's associates and said, oh, U.S. intelligence says uh, – uh, we should talk to you. I said, are you kidding me? Come on. I'm a Canadian. Why would U.S. intelligence want to talk to me? And But they're doing this thing, but it's always this. It never comes through the main guy. It comes through somebody secondary. And it's always keep my name secret. And and they hate me. A lot of the people are, are upset with me because I just don't keep my mouth shut. I, I will not make the deal. I, if someone says, I got a secret for you, can, uh, can you keep it secret? I said, no, don't tell me. I'm telling everybody. It's enough of this game. We've got <laughs> at the top. Then we got MJ 12 2.0. Then we got all the researchers with their secrets. And it's just this multiple thing. The worst thing you can do is have these confidential secrets or sources because that's how they hide the story. Yeah, I've, I've said it a million times. I'm, I'm going public. You give them, yeah. you give, I'm, I'm talking uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, what about this second photograph? Um, has anybody seen it yet? Yeah, Bob McGuire saw it. That's why we put Bob. We interviewed Bob McGuire, and he said, "Yes, I saw it." And then he had, he put out a photograph, and he said, "Here's a here's a ship uh, that might be involved in it, and it's it's a submarine." And Bob was an intelligence guy with the Institute for Defense Analysis, scientific guy, and he takes a photograph of himself on the submarine on the outside, not the inside, because that's classified, and sort of indicates that he saw this photograph, and he said it's got the lights on it, and it's a triangle coming out of the water. And then the, the debrief people all got upset with us, like, oh, you guys should be embarrassed because you, uh, you know, you can't, you, this wasn't your story. And, and it's like, well, no, we got the guy that actually saw the photograph. And so we put it out and, and the Twitter went crazy and everybody was, you know, going after Nicole Sackage and I because we put it out. Uh, but that photograph has been has been withheld. So it's the same thing. It's like all the material is not coming out. It's the same. I heard at one point they had 200 videos, not four. They had 200 videos. And that these things were going to come out and, and this sort of stuff. And it's the same thing. You dangle it out. People talk about it. That's all they want people to do is talk about the story, talk about the story. And, and you're never going to confirm it. Because if they want you to confirm it, they would stand up and tell you. They're not doing it. They're doing this gradual disclosure thing where they always control the thing. Once you spill the milk, you can't put it back in the glass. They want to control the story. So it's this unsubstantiated stories, uh, videos. And they don't really care if people say it's a hoax. They just want people talking about this kind of stuff. Well, I know Bob is listening right now. Bob, email me uh, right now, and if you want to call into the show, I would love to hear from you right now, Bob. I know you're listening. Shoot me an email <laughs> with the phone number that you're going to be calling from, and uh, I'll bring you in uh, to this conversation right now. I saw Bob's uh, uh, original tweet 
um, and I would have to ask Bob this uh, directly. I believe I reached out to him. Um, was it the photograph that he is saying that he saw? Is it the one that was released by the debrief, you know, the pilot, the F-18 one? Because in the description and the artist rendering, right, that I saw, and then I'm looking at the the image in the debrief article, I'm like, that's not a that's not a triangle. I don't see water. I don't see a 90 degree, you know, exit uh, from the ocean uh, surface. I don't see any of that. So I was confused about what Bob was talking about. But you're saying that directly. Bob says, I I saw the original photograph. And my second question is, you know, the triangle with the with the lights on it. Was this a photograph that Bob did he hold it in his hand? Or was this something that was sent electronically? Well, you'd have to ask him. He he said there's two incidents, which indicates to me he'd have to speak for himself. I believe that he saw both photographs. There's two different incidents. So, um, but the one that the 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 one that's the most controversial one is the one where they read this thing on on Rogan's show is to release this the real photograph, the one with the triangle coming out of the water. I, I believe Bob saw that, and there was a report. He could talk to you. He, there was a report written about it. So, um, but I'm not sure where he he said he saw it in in classified channels, and uh, he'd have to talk about you know you know the details of that kind of stuff. Now, there was one other uh, uh, story, well, there was a lot that broke this year, but uh, about the Je- uh, about the Japan military authorizing their pilots and military to report UAP activity and that they have now set up the, the method to do this. Um, is this something that uh, is is working alongside the United States military? Is it the same type of protocol that is being set up? And and what did you think when Japan announced this? I, I really didn't follow that story, but I, I would say that that's probably working with the Americans in terms of sharing information, uh, this kind of stuff. But again, it's, it's at a low level. So if they're just doing UFO sightings, there's still going to be a group way up above that knows the secrets and how it's all fits together. The TTSA stuff or the the ATIP stuff, I think it's still going to be sort of low level stuff. It's there's there's many different uh, programs I believe that that and that would just be one. So um, it, it, they're 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 always going to be sharing material, but it, citing stuff is is not the critical stuff. You want the body stuff, the 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 craft stuff, that kind of stuff. That's the the real stuff that everybody's looking for now. Now, in uh, uh, another breaking story in 2020, of course, was Eric Davis um, quoted in the New York Times article. Down at the bottom of the article, you know, you have to get to the juicy stuff. But he says that he uh, spoke to the Senate and announced to the Senate that we have crashed flying saucers. His words, not mine. That's a pretty dramatic statement as opposed to melted metamaterial, you know, stuff. Uh, that's, yeah. that's a whole nother situation. Do you think Eric is speaking uh, from fact? That's, that's a pretty dramatic statement to make to the Senate, isn't it? Uh, the, the one expression they had is Eric couldn't lie if he tried. Yeah. It, it, Eric is, Eric's a really, really sharp guy and very aggressive. You take a look at what he had gotten in, if the Wilson document is real, that was 2002 or whatever. I mean, that's 20 years ago. Look what he had then. And he's worked these, he's had intelligence background. He started a U.S. Air Force intelligence in South Korea. And, uh, he knows how the, the, the situation works. He knows how the chain of command works. And uh, he, he even made the statement before already, um, the, the fact that um, Lazar is a fraud and uh, the material is not even held at Area 51. So he's from time to time, he's made these kind of very explosive statements. Uh, if you were to guess, uh, you'd probably be good guessing at Roswell. He's made statements like that that indicate, yeah, it's true. And that's why I'm saying the important thing with the Senate is not so much that they're doing it, but they have these high level guys who know where the bodies are buried. So Eric Davis if if it comes back and says, oh, there's no there's no craft, Eric Davis can walk into the Senate and give another briefing and saying, this is where it is. Go to these guys. 
and and you can't you can't stonewall or walk around the Senate because Putoff knows what's going on, Davis knows what's going on. Over all these years, they've worked through uh, you know through NIDs through all these different things. They know a lot of stuff that you and I don't know, and they 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 can support the the Senate in showing them where to go for the material because the Senate wouldn't know. They 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 have no clue where to go, where to look. Uh, you need someone, and they've got the people that Elizondo, same thing. If he's handled uh, some sort of off-world material, well, he'll know where he got it from. He'll know where it's being stored, and they can't tell you and I because it's classified, but they can tell under classification to the Senate Intelligence Committee. I think it's pretty uh, pretty good, that, that provided that the Senate Intelligence Committee pushes. They've, they've got to want to get this thing. But they've got the the background of the people who know where the stuff is, and that's that's half the battle of knowing where they're hiding the material and where they're hiding the documents. Well, it's it's one thing to say uh, that I I said this to the Senate that we have crash flying saucers. That could be you don't know if that event actually happened or not. But what I'm surprised about that is one of the most explosive statements uh, that you can make anywhere in public that is in that New York Times article with zero follow-up. No other reporters uh, picked up on that. Nobody else followed up on it. Nobody went to the Senate to say, hey, wait a minute, the New York Times says, and there's a quote here from this doctor that he told you about we are in possession of crash flying saucers. What's going on here? What's the story? It is. It, it didn't go anywhere, Grant. I, I, I don't get it. If I'm a journalist, that's, that's your story, right? Where's Tucker Carlson with this? Where's anybody else? Nobody followed up on that from the New York Times. Well, Tucker actually was told. I think Lou Elizondo admitted that there was crash material on, on Tucker Carlson's show. No, crash material and crash flying saucers are two different things. Yeah. Okay. But still, you, you, he's they're they're hinting at this stuff is there. Uh, what I've found, and I don't know how many reporters you've dealt with, but the problem with reporters is, like George Knapp always says, it's a steep learning curve. That unless you're working on this all the time, you, there's no chance. You you need to. It's not a big story in newspaper circles. You may have editors who really don't like the thing. Billy Cox used to tell me his editor just tolerates what he does. And and so you you have to put somebody on it to to push because Fox has got the money they got the the talent and stuff like that. Uh, Washington Post had the story. Uh, New York Times you mentioned like they 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 knew that there was this crash material, and yet you're going to get the editor. We need the absolute material or whatever, and you run up against these roadblocks. Um, yeah, the the media has fallen down on the job, but my experience with media over the years is there aren't many media guys who have even a clue of what's going on. Leslie Kane, uh, the guy from the New York, uh, Green Street, from the New York Post, and people like that. But there's not that many people who are actually working on the story. Everybody's into the Trump thing. That's that's easy news. That's easy you know, clicks and stuff like that. That this is a, a real tough story to get to the bottom of, and uh, there's not that many reporters working on it. Yeah, well, the gift is there. Right. The statement is there. I don't know why oh, Ralph Blumenthal or or Leslie Kane or Tucker Carlson didn't uh, immediately go to uh, Dr. Eric Davis and and confirm the quote. Was he misquoted? Was there something funky about the quote here? Do we have crash flying saucers or are you talking about something else? And who did you speak to at the Senate about this and reveal this to? I mean, the gift is there. The headline is there. It's a it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's uh, the story. But the UFO story to me was always the same thing. Like, why don't people go after the UFO story? Because, uh, you know, the with the different witnesses and the military, even the Nimitz, that uh, it sort of hit the story. Um, and and it, it, I, I can give you an example. Uh, you know Angela Joyner. Have you had her on your show? You no, I her? have not. But I know who she is. Okay. Yes. So, so she actually lost her job because of doing the Stevensville, uh, Texas story. And she told me the story. She said, well, no, we're really isn't fired. I was sort of just, uh, we agreed to let go. And I, and they brought her into the office and she had her Rolodex and her computer in a box. I said, Angela, when they do that in Canada, that's, that's being fired. And, and basically what they had said to her, cause the first day they had huge hits in the, in the, the, the story. 
Second day, huge hits again, and sold more newspapers than they ever sold before. And then it started to drop off, and the people kept phoning. And then they said to her, okay, Angela, you've got another story. you got to do the front page story. you got to do the court story. And there's a third story she had to do. We can't keep doing your work. Leave the UFO thing alone. She said, they're phoning. They keep phoning. What do you want me to do? And they said, ignore them. And she then she ended up losing her job over this whole thing. And a lot of editors are just not a big story. Like our friends and relatives, you figure like, why would my friends and relatives not be interested in me talking about UFOs? And they'll tolerate it, but they just go like, yeah, okay, whatever. Grant's into UFOs. I'm really not that that keen or interested. It is the, it is the I, I always say, if you understand what's going on, this is the Super Bowl of all stories. It absolutely is. The uh, oh, I, I need to take a break right here, Grant. I want to keep you over for overtime because I want to talk about uh, 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 we have one segment left uh, about disclosure in in 2021 and and what we can expect there. So uh, you want to hang on and do some overtime with us? Yeah, our, okay. our guest tonight, the one and only Grant Cameron. And this is uh, well, one one follow up before we hit the break. Um we just like Larry King, right? Now we have Tucker Carlson. Do you expect Tucker to keep his foot on the gas uh, moving forward if there isn't uh, a TTSA and their uh, PR department and their marketing to push this forward? Is is Tucker going to still be with the UFO community in 2021? I, I think it might actually be beneficial that uh, he can't, put pressure on Trump because he's pro Trump, but the Biden, he can put the heat on Biden. Okay. We want this. We want an answer, demand answers and stuff like that. It may actually be an advantage to have the other party in power. Now I just uh, uh, went over to the debrief and their lead story is the UAP task force to provide report to Senate intelligence committee. This is from Ryan Sprague. And I had Ryan on the show last week. Um, how much of this report is actually going to go public if you if you had a crystal ball? Um, well, I don't know. It's um, it's going to be a lot more than we have now. That's for sure. I mean, there's going to be uh, um, maybe another couple of sightings that they talk about. The classified stuff, I don't think you're going to see the hardware stuff or anything like that. I think that'll all be... It'll be the sort of the thing they're doing now where, well, we're going to allow Navy pilots and we found out about this Navy pilot and this sighting or whatever, and we have some history of sightings and stuff. I don't think it's going to be major, but it's more than what we've got. And the pressure's on. That's what Lou Alessandro, I think, his job is, is to keep the pressure on him and Mellon and keep forcing the issue and moving it deeper and deeper and, and getting more and more disclosure. Because there's various levels of disclosure. There's disclosure of just, you know, we're doing a report. And then there's just a disclosure of where are these aliens from, why are they here, and what might be the message. There's all these different levels of disclosure. So you're not going to get the big disclosure, but you are going to get um, some sort of Navy admission that this stuff has been going on or how many sightings there are and stuff like that. But n none of the big stuff, I don't think. Not, not right away. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Grant Cameron, live from Canada. It's our second to last show. For 2020, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Again, Grant's website is presidentialufo.com. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. And you can also follow Grant on Twitter at Grant Cameron. We've got everything up in our Twitter feed. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at jimmychurchradio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. 
Introducing the Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hello, my name is Billy Carson, and I'm a best-selling author and the founder of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Together with my team, we have built an all-new conscious streaming TV platform designed with every family member in mind. If you have ever wanted to travel the world and attend lectures and workshops from your favorite speakers but weren't able to, look no further. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. There are dozens of workshops and lectures from speakers you know and love. We have also included amazing categories to assure that your consciousness is entertained and elevating on a daily basis. Amazing interviews, ancient history, ascension knowledge, wisdom teachings, documentaries, conspiracies, mysteries, health and fitness, conscious cooking, meditations, finance, yoga, and so much more. To start your free trial on any mobile device or computer, surf to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's Forbidden Knowledge with the number four, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Again, visit ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. The older we get, the more important it is to stay active and healthy. I exercise regularly, eat right, but recently some new aches and pains have really put a cramp in my routine. A good friend recently told me about Angioprim. She said Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement, helping people since 2003. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, calcium, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages and lead to unexplained pain. Research shows the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that may help promote good cardiovascular health. After a few weeks of taking Angioprim, my pain was gone. Now I'm back and more physically active than ever. Find out more. Go to Angioprim.com, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com, or talk to a trained consultant. Call Angioprim right now, 954-882-7221. That's 954-882-7221. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Grant Cameron. I can't believe it. We are at the end of 2020. It's fully in our rear view mirrors. We're looking straight ahead of 2021. Great conversation tonight with Grant, and we are heading into overtime. And Grant, I'm just going to go straight there. I'm going to go straight to the question. Is 2021 finally the year of disclosure? No. No, it's disclosure. I still think it's a long way off. It, again, it, it it's comes down to what's your definition of disclosure. If your definition is uh, we've got aliens coming from a certain planet, uh, we are flying flying saucers to Mars, we've got an underground base, none of that's going to happen because they may not have it. Uh, you're going to see more. Uh, there's six TV shows I'm, I've heard are coming out next year. You're going to get that kind of stuff. They are leaking stuff into Hollywood. Uh, you're going to see that tape. I've provided it to one of the shows, uh, the tape of the uh, the Intuitive and, and Kit Green. You're going to see some of that stuff coming out, but it's going to be just more of, um, 
you may get some of the hardware stuff. You may get a chance that they're going to confirm yet yeah, we have some hardware. Because if you get um, Eric Davis talking about it, and if you get uh, Lou Alessandro talking publicly about it, then um, we, we, we've got to be pretty close to some sort of admission that, yeah, we do have that kind of stuff. How is the new Biden administration going to approach the subject uh, from, uh, you know, the outgoing Trump administration? Uh, I can tell you how Biden did it in the past. and Not, not great. Um, there was in 2000, and if you remember the, uh, the Kucinich 2007 debate where Kucinich gets asked the question about, did you see a UFO and hear a voice in your head? And, and his career, his, his thing is basically over. When that MMC, MF, M, at MSNBC uh, did interviews after, and they actually talked to uh, Richardson, and they talked to a bunch of people that were in the debate, and that's when they asked Biden. They said, well, what do you think about this uh, UFO thing? And Biden said, UFOs? Are you kidding me? He was really sarcastic about it. I think it's behind the scenes stuff that if Mellon gets in there, there's going to be some pressure. And particularly the main guy will be um, um, John Podesta. And I've asked and nobody knows if John Podesta is involved, but I can guarantee you John Podesta will be in there with both feet pushing hard to move the disclosure, because I maintain that this disclosure that's happening now, the New York Times, the TTSA, all that started under uh, John Podesta and Hillary Clinton back in 2015, and it just fell apart because they didn't get elected. But now he's back in power, and I'm sure he's going to be, he knows, if, if Obama did go and get the documents, or if he, he saw what was going on, Podesta knows, and he's it's his lifelong dream, he wants disclosure, and he's going to be pushing to get out as much. He says, I believe the people can handle the truth. Uh, and he's going to be pushing. So it's him and Mellon that'll be the people behind that'll do it. Not so much Trump or the vice president. It'll be um, Podesta and, and people in the background. Now, even though Mellon and his family and uh, uh, their their history, and it's strong, you have all of that, of course, you know, the Mellon Bank and, 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 and all that is tied to Chris Mellon, but he's now the, the UFO guy. Is he, <laughs> is he untouchable in Washington, or do you see him uh, playing a part in the new administration? It may, it may not be a, an official role, but in behind the scenes, he'll be moving, the same as they've done now. I mean, they're, they're not openly describing the briefings that they're giving to Congress. It's all done sort of behind the scenes. You hear rumors. They're talking to these guys. They know, you know, which strings to pull, which people to push, who knows what's going on. I think it's going to be a background operation. It's not going to be a direct thing where they're going to be doing news conferences and stuff. It's going to be in, in behind the scenes that they know they've, they've already got the Senate on board. Uh, they, they've got some money now. And uh, you're going to see this, this push from the inside, uh, and so provided they get the the green light from from Biden to do it. And I can't see why he would uh, object, although uh, Bush held it secret. Uh, Obama held it secret. There must be something there that makes a president think twice, because uh, I've pointed out. And now it would be 15. This is the 15th administration that has handled the UFO issue since the uh, for, since Roosevelt. And every single administration has done exactly the same thing, which would tend to indicate there's something deep down in this secret that sh that shakes the president and makes him decide, no, nope, I'm not going with it. There's got to be something that's stopping them from disclosing because they I, it more appears now that they all knew the ones that wanted to try to find out found out and decided, no, they weren't they weren't going to they weren't going to go with it, that they they would go along with the secret. And that's what I asked. I wrote an article called the 64 reasons they've decided not to tell you the truth, because I always used to wonder why Jimmy Carter. You see, Jimmy Carter went and he said, oh, if I get elected, I'm going to release all the UFO files, except for the ones that are classified, the, the government stuff or the military stuff. And he never he never used the word UFO once. When he was in the White House, never used it. When he was president, after he was president, when he was president, he never used the word UFO. The same as you remember uh, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford says, this is terrible. Not only should we have a congressional investigation, we should bring them under oath and we should force them to tell us what's going on. 
he became president. He never used the word UFO. He never talked about it. Nothing. Something that the president is told makes these guys completely sh uh, shift. Maybe it's because now it's you're the you're the guy that's going to get, uh, you know, take responsibility for all the stuff that's happened. And they just chicken out or whatever it is. But Obama, that's why I think the Obama thing is so important that he indicated pretty clearly that he had looked and he had found the material and he's not going there. Are you surprised that uh, we keep going back to December 2017 with the New York Times because uh, it, it was so significant, but we call those the days of disclosure. And I think that we all felt, myself included and you, that we were eminent, right? This was it. Finally, we have gotten there. Three years have gone by. Three, yeah. right? It is now uh, 2021. And we didn't, we sort of moved it forward and it, it is being, de but no, it was never officially the days of disclosure. And here we are one more year, right? It's okay, going to be again, one more year. But again, let me point out, what if the situation is that disclosure has taken place? What if the situation is we've got UFO photographs, we've got uh, all sorts of evidence, but we have no idea how it works. We have no idea what they are. Are you going to go public? If you're the president, are you going to stand up and say, I'm the most powerful guy in the world. Uh, we're the most powerful country in the world. And we haven't got a clue what's going on. That's that's the whole thing that you may have got to disclosure is that the reason they're covering it up is because they know so little about what it is. And and I point this out, uh, uh, Diane Pasolka, there's there's different levels of, of, of cover up. So there's the government, but there's also the scientists. So you, you take a look and I say the United States, the number one rule in the United States is money. Number two rule is money. And the most important rule, number three, is money. And and the the, the uh, she talked about the figure. She used the figure $100 million on the NASDAQ. I know what that is about. That is about a piece of UFO technology that was sold for $100 million. The company was sold. There's a lot of money in this. So if you are uh, like uh, all the guys you see, like uh, put off has got patents. Nolan's got patents. All these guys have got patents. If you are the scientist and you are working on this thing, are you going to put it out so that the Chinese can suddenly build a, something and then you've got them like Huawei, make it illegal and national security to stop them from selling it because you put it out on the internet. So uh, there's a lot of money. So you not only have the government, you have the scientists they call them like the, the cosmic club or the, the the invisibles or whatever. And they're all sitting in the background and saying, oh, we're, we're top scientists. We can't come forward or whatever. Believe you me, they are sitting in the background and they realize that there's technology involved and they aren't going to give it up either because th there's a lot of money. When I heard this, I heard the hundred million and I always use the figure a lot of money. When she said a hundred million, the figure I heard was right. It was a hundred million dollars for one piece of technology. Now, uh, one of the things that Mellon got up and spoke about in October of 2017 with the presentation of TTSA and Steve Justice was the technology division of TTSA, and they were going to bring this to the world, that this yeah. was going to benefit all of humanity, that we couldn't keep any of this from the public. All sounded great. The investment happened. Uh, Steve Justice just left. Is that an indication that there wasn't any progress forward, or maybe that wasn't even the intention of TTSA? Um, and yeah, part, part of part of it was was definitely the fact that they had the fifty million dollar offer and they only got two point two million dollars. That they thought that everybody was going to jump all over this and uh, we'd have they'd have money come and companies offering them stuff and like that, and nothing happened. And then they they wanted to go for them. They still needed the money because you need a lot of money to build a flying saucer. And that's when I whether they had it planned beforehand or whatever. But they decided uh, they would go to Congress because if you remember back in the the Obama administration, Leslie Kane was the big star of the day. Go read her book. What were they saying then? Were they saying, "Oh, this is a threat to national security. Uh, we got to do something"? No, they were saying Podesta, who wrote the forward to her book, and her were saying. We should look into UFOs because it might cause airline traffic uh, accidents. That was the thing. And they couldn't sell it. So everybody said, who cares? I mean, they're not going to run into airliners. But th so they changed the scenario and they go to this thing that I always say is this scenario about the threat. 
that they they had to do the threat and and they've even said it even john alexander stood up and said when i did it in the 1980s they did the same thing you go in with a threat because unless you say there's a threat you ain't getting any money that's what you're talking to the defense they've got the money you you do the threat thing so when they went back again and and they they sort of announced that the money was coming then I said, oh, here we go with the threat thing. Now they got to follow through on it. And that's when I posted. I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I posted from Stanton Friedman's file, a 1967 report out of, out of Cuba. Do you know about this story? I, I saw it. I saw your post. Yeah. yeah so, so this is the thing, that, that if you're going to decide that you're going to try to take on this intelligence and you're going to shoot it down, or like Tom DeLong says, we're going to swat some bugs out of the sky and we're going to you know, use nuclear weapons or whatever. Get ready. Make sure your will is, is, is done. Make sure your life insurance is paid up. Because if you saw what happened with the Cuban thing is they, they locked on. The, the back guy was picked up by NSA, uh, a naval uh, unit in uh, Florida, was monitoring the, the Cuban communication. The UFO came in. They told it to back off. The back guy is, is, is talking. And they lock on and they say, take it down. The guy locks on and the back guy goes, he's gone. He's gone. The, the, the thing just disintegrated. And that all went to Stanton Friedman. It went to the National Enquirer, Bob Pratt of the National Enquirer. They went, went through the FOIA. They tried to force the documents out. Even uh, CAUSE, which is Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, actually went to the NSA. They wrote a letter to the NSA and they said, if you do not tell us what happened with the Cuban thing, we're going to talk to the Cuban government. That afternoon, two FBI agents were at... at Todd Zeckel's door and scared the living daylights out of him. This was a serious thing. And that's the whole thing is that we, 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 the, I've even heard that the Russians are told, do not engage because you're going to lose a lot of planes. So now we're in this situation where we played this threat game. We're going to take, you know, we've got to do something with these things and uh, you may have to follow through. That's why I posted that thing is don't be so stupid to think that you're going to, you're going to take this. This technology is so far ahead of us that, that there's no way you're going to take this on. I wanted to talk about the UAP task force really quick. Is it a situation similar to ATIP and OSAP in that it's not an official, you know, Pentagon situation where they have Pentagon uh, office space uh, uh, delegated uh, to this? Um, is this funding that is outside, it's part of the defense budget, but it's not actually inside of the Pentagon where it is a Bigelow private enterprise outside that is getting funded. What do you think uh, the UAP task force ultimately is? No, I think it'll be more. I think it'll be some sort of official uh, unit inside the Pentagon because you've got, they have to do reports to Congress. They're going to have to file all these reports. So I think it's going to be more than just a secret operation in the background because now it's up front. And that's what we're hoping is going to happen is that the uh, there's going to be pressure on Congress, on the Senate to produce these reports. And when it when when it doesn't talk about crash material and stuff like that, the pressure is put on to say you got snowed, go back again and keep the pressure on. So I, th I think it's it's going to be much more official than the other one, which they had to run sort of in the background. Now, uh, and speaking of crash materials, um, are you interested in in melted globulars of of stuff or when we talk about crash materials are you interested in something physical you know like this right I, I, if this was shown to the public right yeah and this is et now we've got something here as opposed to melted stuff what interests you? Are you okay with melted stuff? Uh, I, I actually say, and and if you look at uh, Diane Pasolk, uh, uh, in her book, The American Cosmic, she talks about this Tyler D., the, the head NASA guy. And when he takes her, he blindfolds her and takes her to this crash site in, in New Mexico, takes her and Gary Nolan there. And he calls it, they call it the gifting field. I say, I give a theory called the theory of wow. And basically, I say, why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. Why do they do little zigzags in the sky? What are they, picking up beer? Or what are they? They're just, they're showing off. They want you to see it. They want to get your attention. And the pieces of metal, I, I even asked, I was interviewing Don Schmidt, and he really didn't answer a question, but I said, Don, okay, so you have this thing, and he talked about the, the experiment that was done with the metal, where they shot the 45 caliber gun at the metal, and it sort of bent back, and then the, the bullet just fell to the ground, 
or you take a sledgehammer and you can't break it. And then I say, well, okay, so why does the pieces that we get when we get a crash, why does it look like a, a wine glass that's been dropped off the fifth floor of a balcony? Like these little tiny pieces. Like if, it's, if you can't break it with a sledgehammer, why is it breaking these little pieces? And it may be because they're actually just dropping this stuff. And and the the analogy is like a cat. Have you ever seen a cat when, when they got the little ball and it's got the, the – uh, the cat nip in it, and the, the cat's chasing the ball around, and then it, it's it's like it gets it and it goes, ah, oh, we got it. It's like the Nivets, we got the photos, and then it's like, oh, okay, what do we do now? And then it's like, oh, let's get the next one, and then they go chasing after the the ones in 2015, and let's get that one. And they're doing the same thing with the metal. So you get the metal, and it's like, oh, the isotopes are all bad, and and the cat the cat looks up and looks around. And it's like, oh, what am I gonna do now? It's like, what do I do with this? And they've got the metal. They don't know what to do with it. You're not gonna build. Because the isotopes are bad, all that says is it's not made on Earth. But it doesn't teach you how to build a flying saucer. So then they say, okay, let's get that piece that the house got. Then the house got that meta, that piece that's layered. And they get that piece. You're not going to learn anything from that kind of stuff. The back engineer from a piece of craft, it, all I think the beings are, are just dropping that stuff as entertainment. It's like throwing a, 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 the catnip into a cage with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a cat. That's, that's what I think they're doing. And they're they're actually gifting, and even the, the the big crashes may actually be gifts where they actually crash on purpose because it doesn't make any sense. Especially the idea that little pieces that a UFO will fly across the galaxy and then little pieces start falling off it. You got to go like something else is going on here. Let's pay attention, and that's why I've always spent so much time with the experiencers, the people that are interacting with the intelligence. What are we really dealing with? And the whole idea of consciousness that I've got 50 people who have flown the craft. And they all say exactly the same thing. Unless you've got consciousness and put your hand on a panel, put your hand on a ball, it ain't going anywhere because it's flown with the mind. And that's the part of the stuff we're missing. And Lua, and put off was asked, Does, is TSA working on, on consciousness? He said, no. As long as you're not working on consciousness and you're working on this metal stuff, you aren't, get, you aren't going anywhere. And that's what... Uh, that's what uh, Eric Davis said they shut the program down in 1989 because they weren't getting anywhere. That's the whole core story. Hell put off. Kit Green and Jacques Ballet get together at a Denny's restaurant in the 1980s and say, what do we know for sure? We know we're being visited by something. We have crash material and we're not getting anywhere with it. That's what's in the Wilson document. The whole idea that you aren't going to figure it out until you bring in consciousness into it, until you figure out what the what the beings are, have the, the, the experiencers. You can't do it from a piece of metal. And even with the craft, where if Eric Davis is right, they shut it down. And the idea was that every seven or eight years, they take it off the shelf and it still can't figure it out. They put it back on the shelf again and they have no clue what's going on. They have not, as Don Schmidt says, they don't have the start button on the thing. They, they, they're, all of it is just smoke and mirrors. Because what you need to do is you've got to convince the government, oh, we've got the cure to cancer. We're only $5 billion away. If you give us $5 billion, we'll get the cure to cancer and we'll build this flying saucer. If you go to the Congress and say, we haven't got a clue what's going on. We have no, no back, nothing at all. You're not going to get any money. You have to buy them that it's a threat, number one, and number two, that you can solve the problem. And so I think a lot of it is bluff that they have this stuff. I don't think they have as much as people think they have. Well, and, and for you, what would you accept from a, a state actor uh, when it comes to disclosure? I mean, what is it, uh, what is it that is good enough for you? Uh, the community, they want the president on live television, right? That, that is disclosure for, for most. For you, what would you accept? Well, again, it comes down to what do you mean by disclosure? So I accept the disclosure that the uh, the Pentagon confirmed that, yes, there was an ATIP program. And we were right all along because I was on a show in 2016 and Mellon was on the same show as me. He came, I went. I was talking about managing magic. He came on right after me and said, I would know. There's no UFO program. I would know. I was there. I was the top guy. And then suddenly he's he's the reverse. He suddenly gets told. And, and, and so... The fact that the that the Pentagon admitted that there was a UFO program is a big disclosure step. Now, the next step is to admit that they've got crash material and then to go to who's actually flying it. But those are different steps. So I, I take it as steps. I, I, I the, the ultimate thing would be the president to stand up. But if they don't know what's going on, if they don't know what these beings are or what their their purpose is, and they don't know how to fly them, you're not going to get the Secretary of Defense stand up or the President stand up because the President's going to look like a total idiot. The President is supposed to be the most powerful guy in the world who has the answer to everything. You're not going to stand him up and make him look like an idiot, especially or put your cards down on the table. So you say, okay, we got uh, this this piece, this piece, the 20%. The Russians go, 
Oh, thank you. We got the other 80%. Thank you for the pieces. Uh, and off they go. You, it's like a, it's like a bluffing card game that people don't have the answers and you don't put your cards down because everybody else is playing the same game and there's so much money and there's so much technology involved that nobody wants to play it. It's this game where you just keep paying your taxes. We'll take care of it. We're the defense department. We'll take care of you. Uh, this is serious business. It's a, it's a, you know, we need to get it before the Russians and we don't care if you're interested or what, what supposedly George Bush told to Jimmy Carter during the president election briefing curiosity on behalf of the president is not sufficient need to know. doesn't matter. I don't care if you want to know. We are we are protecting the United States of America. They believe they're saving the world or they're making money from patents or whatever it is. And they've got the power. And it, it's almost like a, a, an agency where you're going to come in and say, OK, we're you guys, we're doing the job you guys are. So give up your agency in the government. It's all about how many people work for you, how much money in your budget. Nobody's given up anything. What a fantastic conversation tonight, Grant. And, and just thank you so much. I, I appreciate every time you're on with us. Um, but I wanted to ask you uh, really quick. I've got two minutes left. I think earlier in the show, you said you've got a book that you are working on uh, for 2021. Uh, can we go back to that really quick? What is it? Uh, I have a book on um, psychedelics coming first, and then I have a book called The Alien Documents. And these are documents that were uh, given to me over the years, people would have, like I mentioned, this this thing with Ron Pendolfi with the briefing thing. Um, I have I was given the uh, a pres uh, a draft of a manuscript for an eyes only study for President Johnson. I have that. I'm going to put some of those documents. What the conclusion was. Um, I, I of course the Wilson document that I got. Um, I've got uh, the John Alexander's notes uh, from the guy in the Wilson document that set up the Wilson leak thing. Uh, uh, um, Oak Shannon. Yep. I've got Oak Shannon's notes. I'm going to put all these things in a book called The Alien Documents. It's just all these documents that people haven't seen before. And that will be released in 2021. Hopefully in 2021, yes. Thank you so much, Grant. Uh, behave and be well. Have a great new year. I can't wait yeah. to uh, uh, come back on with this, but uh, let's see how 2021 unfolds. It's going to be great. Thank you so much, Grant. Thank you amazing conversation and with that uh not only do we just go uh pole to pole with uh, grant cameron but i think it is very important for all of us to realize how everything is compartmentalized it uh it's just the way that it is i'm not so sure that everybody has all of the answers when it comes to the ufo question and i really want to know what the UAP task force ultimately is for all of us. With that, I'm going to get out of here tomorrow night on the show. Dr. Stephen Greer. Fade to Black is produced by executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2020 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody tomorrow night. Dr. Stephen Greer will be here. Until then, everybody be safe. Fade to black. <laughs>